This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Open Skies in the Masai Mara. You can see there's a few little puffy clouds in the distance, but otherwise still a bit of blue around um, and fairly warm today, actually. It's been quite hot during the course of the morning, which probably means we're going to get a bit of rain at some point. In fact, when I look over the escarpment, there's a lot of cloud that is coming that way. But my name is Tristan on camera. I've got a Manu this afternoon, and it is a very warm welcome to the show that comes brings you animals live in your living room, which means that we want to actually talk to all of you because otherwise it's very boring if we just drive around and none of you actually talk to us. We like to hear about all the things that you have to say, particularly if you have questions. And so if you have questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or at FC on the YouTube chat. And you just have to keep it relevant to what you're actually seeing on the screen and we'll hopefully answer as many as possible. You can see Manu showing you where the clouds are and maybe a little bit of rain that may be starting to fall and also where we are heading. So Manu and I are going to be heading in that direction. We're going to be going onto the other side of that forest in the hopes that we can find the Ololololo pride. We had them this morning. They were looking hungry. There was buffalo nearby. There was zebras nearby. There was waterbuck, giraffe. And so hopefully this afternoon we might get them up and moving, particularly if a storm starts to roll in. There's the dark cloud that I was telling you coming over the escarpment. And so if that starts to come in and rain starts to fall, I wouldn't be surprised if the Ololololo pride decides to start come moving and hunting but i'm not the only one out here this afternoon there will be two of my co-workers that will be with me one of them will be down south in south africa and his name is sydney and he wants to say hello to all of you so you can see that there is a movement of a very big animal behind the green bushes there that is our largest land mammal is the elephant and a very very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari i am sydney from morani mikosi and i'm traveling with a craig who is my professional camera operator we are going to be with you this afternoon and we will try by all means and get you see a lot of interesting animals we are easily accessible Accessible. You can follow us for your questions and comments on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. So it's quite a small head. You can see we've got also um, the big one and the little one is also feeding on some of the uh, small trees there. These elephants, they are very lucky because it rained a lot here by the Juma Game Reserve and the bush is bringing all the nutrients. They must be enjoying the taste at the moment. Elephants don't worry too much about the tannin levels by this kind of vegetation. A tannin is a poison the trees are secreting in order to regulate the browsing activities. Browsing has got something to do with the consumption of the leaves from the trees. <laughs> I am also enjoying the vegetation when it's looking very green like this. The only challenge by this time of the year is some of the trees flowering plants, when they're bringing flowers, you pick up different kind of scent. Some of the flowers smell sweet and some of them, they smell bad. But there's reasons behind those kind of smells. Some, they smell sweet to attract the insects, whereas some, they smell bad in order to chase away the animals who might come and feed on their flowers. James, um, the elephants, each head of them, which is consisted of uh, the uh, daughters and the little ones, is led by the oldest uh, matriarch. Matriarch is the one responsible, is the one in charge of giving orders by the head. So the elephants, uh, without the uh, matriarch, is always a challenge. But if they lose the matriarch, uh, another one has to take over and lead the group. Unfortunately, here, the males, they are not responsible at all. And they don't have any say when it comes to the decision making. No disagreement between male and females.
Vicky, uh, the alleys are very beautiful animals. You can see that one is feeding on a plant. That plant, I can recognize it from far, and that is the sickle bush. The sickle bush is one of the plants which has got a very, uh, it's very rich in terms of the protein content. It contains over 4% of the uh, proteins. So normally you will get the amount of proteins up to 8%. So that's why these big animals rely on the acacia trees as well as the sickle bushes to get quite a lot of energy to move that very big body size. <laughs> Alex, the elephants, they don't really have a favorite specific food, but they do have a specific favorite fruit, which is the amarula. The marula fruit, the one which makes the amarula beer, that is their a special kind of a fruit. But when it comes to the vegetation, elephants are not selective, they are bulk feeders. That is why these kind of animals don't lose weight even during the dry season, because they don't have, their diet is consisted of variety of vegetation types including the grasses so I can see that these elephants they are moving away and while they are moving away uh, let me also uh, lead you to Tristan who is also moving around the Kenya Masai Mara I am indeed I'm on the move like your elephants, Sydney. I hope I don't look like an elephant, although the way that we get fed by Chef Joel here in the Mara, it's probably very possible at this stage of the game. Anyway, we're slowly kind of moving along. You'll see we're kind of just on the edge of the forest at the moment. It's just kind of coming this side. And what's really nice is that we had a brief view of um, the Kitra male, the, the dark of main one, um, and he's on the other side. So everybody has gone that side to go view, look at him which means that this side is going to be nice and quiet and nobody really should be anywhere near us. Now Manu, do you think you can get that bird of prey? I know it's quite far, but let's have a little look-see because we're still looking out for our snake eagle, which actually I have a nice update about. So one very fortunate thing about what we do here is that we get to work with a lot of very, very knowledgeable people. Um, the other really nice side of it is that we get to um, have a whole bunch of very knowledgeable viewers that watch our show daily and a lot of you contribute a lot there's there's a lot of different names that come to mind so you know Judy H and James Richard and um, one other gentleman also that helps us a lot is Project Alpha now Project Alpha this morning we were talking about the snake eagle that I was saying is very uncommon and he was saying he has a feeling that we've seen it before on drive. It was identified at the time as a, a black-chested snake eagle, a, a young black-chested snake eagle in its second plumage. Um, but he didn't really think much, it, it, did, it, it resembled that. And so he kind of sent me the photos and said, what do I think? And I forwarded it on to the raptor guys here in the Mara and um, asked them what their opinion was. And they reckon that he's spot on. In fact, it was that very special snake eagle, which I still can't pronounce, by the way. Um, and I actually think we might have found the other one that's spending time here. You know that. This looks just like it. So it has supposed to have a little white throat patch which this one actually does look like it would be a coincidence if we did find it. <laughs> so Project Alpha says, well, flattery will take us far. Thank you. I hope so. No, I'm joking. It's just that Project Alpha always helps us with some very, very interesting stuff. He often sends through some really epic articles about um, studies that are being done and some very sort of scientific and te um, technical stuff, which is really hugely valuable and, uh, and that goes to every single one of you that help us out with all the things with IDs and everything like that I don't think you guys a lot of you realize how appreciated it often is by a lot of the presenters here we had, I, I certainly appreciate it and I know a lot of the others do when we speak to you a lot of the guys um, you know everyone kind of really appreciates being helped out from time to time um, as much as we try and kind of gain knowledge and assimilate knowledge on our own it's, it's just having a community and having so many different resources from everybody means that we all learn that much faster and that's what makes what we do so special um, in many respects is that there's nowhere else where you can have this many people all together twice a day for six hours discussing wildlife related things and actually learn about it so it's a pretty special 
a pretty special thing. Right, now I want to just double check this bird because this bird looks very, very, very uh, much like what we are really looking for. And it, this is the area that it keeps being seen in. So it is a snake eagle. You can see it's got featherless legs, right? Now its back is almost impossible to tell. But there you can see the barred tail that is very much a indicative sign of this species. And it does have the white throat. Now Project Alpha, what do you reckon? Anybody else want to see or maybe get a screenshot that can they can blow up if we can just get the bird to turn again and see what we think. I have a funny feeling that it might be one of them. Apparently there's two or three of them that come to the Mara, um, into the Mara Triangle every year. It's a very special bird, like I say, it occurs in West Africa, so it's, I'll try and say it again, Bedanes or Bedanus, Bedanus. How would we say it? I don't even know man. how to say it. I'm butchering the name horribly. The French people are going to kill me. But anyway, it's apparently that's the name of it. So I'll, I'll show you all now so you can all have a little look at what how the spelling is. But it's very tricky with snake eagles out here because you get um, the juveniles, black chesteds can often look a little bit like it. Um, and so it, it's not easy to always tell. But this one definitely has like a creamy throat patch and a gray sear, which you know, there's the right kind of things for it. The head just doesn't look quite right. It's so far away though that it's tricky to tell. Can you guys also see the spider web that's blowing in the wind too, which is quite cool. So Project Alpha, you also reckon it's worth watching. If it just turned, it would be so much easier. Now you can see there's a bit of the spider webs that are kind of coming all over the place. Now those will just be um, lines that a spider throws out and uses to be able to go to the next place. So when it wants to build a web from one place to another or when it wants to get a long distance, they'll basically do what's called ballooning. So they'll let out silk and then they use that to be able to get to another point or well, basically the silk to get to another point to then anchor and be able to then start building their nests across and sometimes you get very long strands that will flutter in the breeze and you can see how long that one is it's coming all the way looks like possibly from even past that left hand tree Oof, this bird i'm not sure i i hesitate to make a call on it to be honest i'm hoping it will turn it looks very much like it. Right, well, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time here. I just want to see if it will turn or fly for me and see if we can get anything diagnostic from there. While I do that, though, David wants to say good afternoon, and he's with elephants just like Sydney was. Hello, everyone. And it's a bit tricky sometimes when you see the eagles when they're juvenile. That's always... Uh, a stage when they could be a bit confusing but I'm sure Tristan is very good in biting he's going to figure it out and know what exactly type of a snake he got is well my name is David and good afternoon everyone and with me on camera today is Achi it's a very warm welcome to a drive I'm on the other side of the Mara while Tristan is on the other side well very nice to start with elephants on such a lovely day in terms of weather the light is just perfect not a single drop of rain the elephants are just walking there and it's a small family with the young ones and remember our safari drive is always very interactive so your questions and comments give us lots of happiness and I'm sure you know how to send them Brevin, very good. You're the first one to ask the question, and I was just saying on how to ask questions. I'm sure you all know on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, or you can keep following us on the YouTube chat stream. Well, Brevin, I'll tell you, the African elephants, to me, have slightly larger ears than Indian ears, other than the Asian elephants, as you can see there, what Archie is showing you. And in every part, or in every body organ, I would say, or body part of an African elephant, it's big by any standard. Talk of the ears, the tusks, you know, the legs, the trunks, the tails. I personally think that the African elephant is bigger by maybe 10, 15%. I'd be happy to hear what Tristan and Sydney would, would say, but ideally, I would say they're bigger. And Brayburn's still looking at that ear. 
I remember when we were in college, we used to make jokes that to tell them apart, apart from the obvious differences, as you see, that one doesn't have a tail and that's not going to be one of the differences between the African and the Asian elephant. While in college, we used to make jokes that to tell them apart, males of the Asian elephants have tusks and the females do not have. And the African elephants, it's both sexes, the males and the females. But above all, coming back to your question, Braven, if you look at that ear there, we used to say the ear of an elephant or the African elephant's looks or the ticks, the shape of an African map, and the ears of the Asian elephants look like the Asian maps. I do not know whether that makes sense, but that's what we used to say while we went to college. Now, as temperatures are warming up, what these ellies will keep doing is to keep flapping their ears I'm sure we all know the cooling of the blood is done around the ears. So that young calf there, who you will guess could be going to about three years of age, because you can see that young or the small tusks coming out. She just uprooted a whole plant for herself. So any time they try to bring something out of the ground, using their trunks and it doesn't work out, they'll always give it a small nod or a small knock using their feet. And that one helps to bring it out. Now they got all their ears out, as I was saying earlier, just to help cooling off. Sinak, good question, and always very happy to hear your name, Sinak. Well, the people around here have respected the elephants very much, and unless Sinak there's a drought, and we see the elephants getting outside the game reserve, and going out and terrorizing the locals. I'm talking of the elephants going to their homes, not their homes per se, going to their gardens and attacking or eating their crops in Ak. Ideally, they have a very good relationship between elephants and the locals. The biggest challenge in Ak here is between the hippos and the local community and sometimes the buffaloes. We have what you call human wildlife conflict, but we have lots of game rangers will always come around and educate the locals on what to do and not what to do. Should they spot, for example, elephants from a distance and they think they're going the direction towards their villages or their homes, they have what you call community wardens who they report to and the, uh, the game rangers will come and push them back to the game reserve. Lovely. My plans today, I don't want to look for lions, I want to look for the black rhino, but Archie spotted a very useless bird. And I'm sure as Tristan is working on his bird at one point, I'm sure he'll come back to me to show you one very special bird that uh, Archie just spotted. But in the meantime, let's go first back to Tristan. Well, our bird, unfortunately, is not helping things at all at the moment. It's really not kind of playing the game. It's stayed exactly the way it is. But what I can tell you is that it definitely has a very yellow eye um, and a black beak, which is the right kind of diagnostic features for that kind of bird, but so does the black-chested. But it just doesn't look right to me for a black-chested youngster. It's so tricky in, in, this, in this particular part of the world. Also, the short-toed eagle also looks quite similar. So... I don't know. I mean, could it be? I was hoping it was going to fly after it ruffled its feathers a little bit just now. I was hoping that I was going to see it actually take off and then we could actually get a better sort of look at it. But it really is tricky to kind of see a lot of definition. It's also against the light, which is not helping at all. What you can see though below it is a giraffe head. So while we're kind of hoping that the bird will move, we can discuss giraffes a little bit. You can also see there's a lot of heat haze. So I was saying that it's fairly warm in the sun today and, and it's probably the warmest day we've had in the last week and, and that will make things probably a lot drier which is good for us um, but the problem with heat is it often brings about a lot more sort of torrential downpours in terms of rain um, and so you know I'm hoping that we don't get rained on this afternoon except that I do want the Olololos to start moving oh tricky Kathy, exactly. So you'll often see bark spiders. They use ballooning quite regularly when they build their webs across roads. Um, 
So they'll often um, use ballooning to do that, um, and that will attach then to the other one from one side of the road to the other, and that will allow them to then kind of develop that web and be able to to spin it. And you'll often come across it at night, and should be a good time of year for bark spiders. Um, Now that we've had a bit of rain. The guys should start seeing them early, early in the morning. You'll often come across them more just as it's the sun, or just after the sun has set. You'll find them, and it's amazing how fast those bark spiders are able to spin their webs. All right, well, we'll leave our eagle there. It's unfortunately not um, decided to fly. I'm going to keep an eye out where the lions are. Not far, so hopefully it flies towards us at some point. Maybe some of you got some screenshots. Um, and maybe we can figure it out. I don't know. Let's let's try and see what we can do. There's unfortunately no road that goes any closer, so we're a bit hamstrung in that regard. But it sounds like David is also doing a spot of birding, and he's found something delightful to show you. Well, from one maybe raptor to another raptor, but I'm sure at one point we are going to establish quit uh, but that is and screenshots will is will make us maybe sit tonight during dinner and we're gonna compare notes and find out who she is but we have one here that is an ego that's in black and white you do not mistake the secretary bird for any other bird she's very unique in every shape and form how she is designed her body morphology basically she is very different from all the other birds well, I call her the ground eagle as much as she's now on top of a tortured tree. And she's one of the most beautiful birds of that size that I would say. I don't know what Archie thinks, whether it could be a favorite for him, but eagles of this size, this is my favorite one. And they tend to spend most of their time on the ground. But we are now, now more convinced than ever before that they got a nest there. Sharon, how are you today? And you're saying you adore Secretary Bird. I agree with you a hundred percent. It could not be anything better. Sharon, think of this bird when she walks on the ground. I'm sure you've seen her on the ground. They're very majestic when they walk. And the feathers, how they stick out behind their heads. And you see that tail feather there? It is very unique. It doesn't remind me of the peacock because when she got her wings out, she doesn't look like a peacock. But that tail when tips you know the, feather, the the tail feathers when they are out they make her very very good looking well she's an ego as i said earlier and she spends most of the time feeding on the ground and we call her the secretary bird which i think is arabic uh, french corruption of arabic secretaire which means a hunter's bird so many birds will eat snakes just like exactly what tristan had but this ones to me are experts in eating snakes not experts as snakes being the main diet but is how they kill them you will see them tramping on snakes you know they have a skill on how they bring down the snakes they walk very majestically in the grass and the moment they spot one you see them leap just like that like a savo cat step on it and using the other foot and ding 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 and they kill it and interestingly more often than not they'll always swallow this snake's life well there are two on that tree let me see if you could be lucky to see the other one. And as I found out whether there could be two or the visuals could be good, we'll take you back to South Africa, to Sydney, who got some very huge mammals. So the alis are now starting to come out through the clear space. You can see that they are not deep in the thick bushes anymore, but they are still concentrating on some of the thorny trees. Now they are feeding on one of the vachelia, which is the acacia. This is the biggest I have seen so far, and not very far away there is even a little one. Uh, this one might be the female, which is nursing the little ones. If you look at the trunk when he is trying to pick up some leaves, you will see that this trunk does not have the knobs. Sometimes elephants, you will see the trunk having some kind of uh, knobs on it. When it's having the knobs, it is a sign of a milk deficiency. Normally, uh, you will see those kind of knobs by the small ones. 
if the mother dies when having a lactating small one, if that small one is not going to get a lot of milk, uh, you will see the milk deficiency in the sign of uh, the symptoms will be the knobs on the trunk. So, but elephants, they are so very social in such a way that the other lactating females can also nurse the little one when the mother is dead. So the uh, little ones, they are going to be... Lisa, the elephants, they eat quite a lot. The elephants eat approximately 400 kilograms a day. And from the 400 kilograms they eat, they're only just, to go, they're only just going to digest 48%. And 48% is a too little. So that is why the insects, my favorite insects such as the dung beetles, they prey on elephant dung because there is quite a lot of whole nutrients available in their droppings. So their droppings look very much green and if you open them, not finally digested and rich in terms of water. So if you check there, you will see that uh, I can say that is true, uh, it is quite a lot. So it's a sign to us that elephants need quite a lot of vegetation to survive. So it is punishing the elephants, having the elephants in the area which is not having a lot of, a lot of trees and a lot of grass for them to eat. So, and they drink 150 to 200 liters a day. So it's not only about the trees, there must also have to be quite a lot of uh, water availability so that they can be able to digest uh, the trees nicely. Some people will tell you elephant has got a poor digestive system, but I don't think they've got a poor digestive system. That is how they digest. They, they've got to defecate after every 45 minutes. So every 45 minutes, you will see the droppings coming out. So that is clear that they do digest the food, and this food has to come out after a very short period. So you can see now it's time to eat the grass. child of the universe uh, fortunately the thorns by the trees don't really affect the elephants uh, the inner parts of the elephant mouth is adapted to eat these kind of thorn trees so thorns are nothing compared to the spines elephants eat the sickle bush sickle bush is a spined tree a spine is that modified stem which has got some of the leaves growing on them and is very hard sometimes you can even punch your tires by driving over the elephant dungs. <laughs> that is how strong the spine is. So it's not ideal at all to drive over the elephant dungs. But uh, apart from uh, running away from the thorns and the spines, by this time of the year, after the heavy rainy season, the dung beetles are back. And some of the dung beetles, they feed from underneath the drop droppings. And as I have indicated earlier, they prefer the elephant dungs. And because of that, they stay underneath the elephant dung droppings. So you must have to avoid driving over the elephant dungs by all means otherwise you are going to uh, kill the significant insects such as dung beetles who are here in order uh, to facilitate a lot of decomposition in the bush so you can see that uh, a very a big animal can easily hide behind these bushes. So now let's cross over to the Masai Mara where David is waiting also to take over. Well, very good, Sydney. And talking of dung beetles, I have always uh, noticed dung beetles prefer more buffalo poo to make the balls or the dung balls than maybe elephant uh, the elephant dung i don't know what uh, Cyril might think we have gotten ourselves a small herd of buffaloes here and they're taking advantage of the grass now having all the migration 
or all the wild beasts gone back to Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. This is the African buffalo. It's a herd of males and females together. So you can see that uh, these elephants are slowly moving much more towards our side. I can see that some of these head members are slowly making their way in. It's just that they are being kept busy by these trees. They are getting excited with the nutritious trees. So I'm just going to try and pull forward a little bit as the big one is now approaching a nice and very clear space. So we're going to have a good sighting from there. Here they are, nice and close. So you can see that uh, they are just coming from the mud bath. A child of the universe, uh, the uh, trees it's just that a lot of people, they give a different terms when it comes to the chemicals produced by these trees. Some will tell you the trees, they release a tree fennel in order to regulate browsing. Some will tell you they produce something called a prontocyanidine. And some will tell you the tree produce a tannin. All these things, they serve a same purpose, which is regulation of the browsing activities on these trees. So you can see that now these elephants are feeding on the grasses, not only specifically feeding on trees. So it's a confirmation of a fact that elephants are bulk feeders. They are not even uh, taking the grasses completely from the ground. Sometimes when there's a shortage of food availability, you will see them taking the whole plant and shake it in order to get rid of the sand before they, they uh, take the grass to the, to the mouth. But now they are just taking the top part every time taking the top part which is something good so this shows that elephants they do play a significant role when it comes to the stimulation of the growth by the grasses So now let's uh, cross over to the Masai Mara where the buffaloes are also having some grasses at the moment. Very true, Sydney. And there's only one huge difference between buffaloes and elephants when it comes to feeding. The elephants will very easily diversify. And in terms of drought, we have always seen, should say, the two species die because of starvation. Elephants may die last. Elephants are able to diversify. From the grass, they'll go to the leaves. From the leaves, they'll go to twigs. From twigs, they'll go to tree barks. And when, you know, situation become very bad, they are also able to dig food for themselves from the ground, which the buffaloes will not be able to do. Now, look on the horizon there, and that is the eastern side of the Mara Triangle. And what you're seeing are very thick and heavy clouds, an indication that it might be a bit stormy much later. But from where we are, so far, it is so good. As Tristan was saying earlier, we are on the onset of the short trains in Kenya, out here in East Africa in general, and the Mara Triangle is not exceptional. So every other day, I would say we have had about 40, 60 millimeters of rainfall. That's my guess. And there are a couple of days we have had like a whole 36 hours of rain. Now, that reminds me of June, July, in the middle of the year, when we had very heavy rains. King, that's a very good question. In Kenya, I would say we have two seasons of rainfall. We have the short rains and the long rains. And apart from that, normally we normally have, I would say, summer all around the year. 
Long rains are over and they ended around June, July. What we have now are the short rains. But I would say the weather parts in the last few years in Africa have been quite erratic. What I would call short rains might turn out to be very big rains. I mean, yesterday I was out in the drive in the afternoon and I got stuck for a couple of minutes. Not because of the rain of yesterday, but just because of the mud. The kind of geology here, we have what we call the black cotton soil, and when it rains, it becomes very sticky. So me and Tristan, when we drive, we have to be very careful. Well, I'm not going to wait for the rains to come, and I'm not sure whether this Topi is aware that rains are coming, what it want us to go, or we would want Tristan to show us some lions before maybe the storms arrive. Yes, we have found exactly what we were hoping for. And look at that, she's going to walk right past us. So she's going to walk within a few meters, which is my favorite thing when lions do this. She should be walking probably, I would say, within about a meter of where we are. But you can see that she is looking thin. So food is going to be high up on the list of priorities for that lioness. And I wonder if now with the rain and the wind just starting, that this is going to be the start of them starting to wake up and moving and trying to go. The problem is the rest of them are all fast asleep as you can see that's one of the young boys that's taking a nap at the moment hopefully he is going to be able to wake up soon and we'll be able to see what um, whether or not they are actually going to wake up properly and decide to move which you can see very fast asleep now he's got a slightly fuller belly I'm sure that's still from the buffalo that they had a few days ago they finished that buffalo two days ago so I, as far as we know they haven't eaten since then unless they ate something very small which is possible they could have eaten something like an impala or maybe something like a warthog a small warthog so they haven't had a big meal though as far as we know um, and that means that these guys will in all likelihood given the size of the pride will want to probably try and find some semblance of food I'm just trying to see where she's going at the moment so she's on the road walking but before we get into that right I had a quick sort of thing just hold on Manu sorry let me just try sort this out because I've got the wrong thing on here uh, give me two seconds okay there we go all right so this is that eagle what it's supposed to look like in flight right so this is what the 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 image when I search images that's in flight now we managed to while we were kind of doing things managed to get one in flight so that's a shot that I got of this bird in flight the one we just saw taking off and to me they look very 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 similar um, and so I think it is actually one of a very special eagle so that should be a lifer for many of you I'll make 100% sure and send it off just to double check but I think that we managed to find the bird that we were looking for which is how cool is that considering we were talking about it it doesn't happen like that very often and it's happened to me twice this week last week I mean early on in the week I said it would be a nice place to find a rufous bellied heron and we got a rufous bellied heron and then we talked about the snake eagle and we got that too but the lioness is walking so enough about our snake eagle which I'm excited about it's always nice when you get to see a lifer as a guide you don't get to see them all the time and especially the, you know when you get to spend a lot of time in the bush life has become fewer and fewer and fewer and harder and harder to come by so so project alpha says you are convinced that's the one thank you exclamation point absolute pleasure very very cool that we can actually confirm and we can have that I, I would like to know from some of you particularly those that have kept extensive Mara lists um, what number it is for you guys I know a lot of you do keep bird lists and it's always nice that you do I, I find it very cool that you do it's a, it's a special thing that you can say that you've seen this many birds on cameras um, in in Africa which live which is very cool so um, I would like to know from all of Apologies for the inconveniences on behalf of the team. Uh, the signals are bad at the moment by the Masai Mara, but will, it will come back soon. Now I am heading much more towards the Buffalo Hook Dam just to go and see if we cannot find any of the spotted cat in the area. My specific target is Rosana. I have seen Rosana yesterday. I'm just going to take it from previous. He just went towards the torch wood and he was doing some hunting. Maybe we might be lucky around the Buffalo Sook Dam area. So 
Oh, he was coming from this area yesterday afternoon and we escorted him all the way down from the buffer stadium to at the fire break. So I have not yet picked up the uh, tracks of any of these spotted cats at the moment. And neither the lions nor the leopards yet. So now let's uh, quickly go back uh, to the Masai Mara and carry on from previous. My apologies again, there is a challenge to do with the network this afternoon. So let's see what we are going to find here by the Buffer Sook Dam. So you can hear the woodland kingfisher is giving us a warm welcome to the dam. So that was uh, quite a lovely call from the woodland kingfisher. Oh, more elephants here where we are at the moment. And this elephant has got some small babies. So the elephants are moving much more towards uh, the side where we are. You will see they've got some small babies there. Look at that tiny little baby. It's underneath. Uh, the mum is crossing just underneath. You can see it's too small. can be able to pass in between the legs, between the front and uh, the hind legs. So maybe it's time now for the little one to have something to drink. So elephant is the only, is one of those animals which can a giraffe girl and the elephants they don't choose the trees but some of the trees elephants I not, never saw them eating trees such as the euphobia trees the euphobia trees are those kind of species of trees which has got a very high milk production so when the tree uh, is secreting quite a lot of uh, uh, latex Latex is that milk coming from the leaves. Elephants, they do avoid those kind of trees. And apart from that, elephants don't like the chilies. They don't like the pepper chilies because of what is called a capsaicin molecule, a molecule which gives a chili a hot sensation. Elephants can be able to pick it up from a distance and avoid those kind of trees. And sometimes they even avoid those kind of areas. So you can see that uh, these elephants, they look wet a little bit, which is a sign that they have been to the waterhole maybe. The mud is from here where we have just arrived, the buffalo hook, buffalo hook dam. If not from here, it means it's from, oh, look at that tiny little one there. So if, if uh, it's not from here, it means it's from one of the uh, waterholes they have created. Elephants, they are very good when it comes to the creation of the natural waterholes. Look at that little one there. So elephants are very peaceful animals, but when the little ones are still small and when they've got injuries, when the bullies on must is when they can be very much dangerous. So that little one is uh, very much small, but the little one at the moment he is uh, relying on the mother for feeding uh, purposes. Until they get to three years is when they are going to start feeding uh, by themselves. But from the head to remain with the other ones, they've got to live until they are 16 years. After 16 years is then that uh, the little ones are going to become independent. So it's normally when it comes to us humans, 18 years is when we are starting to become independent. So the elephants, they're just doing it two years before that.
<laughs> MW uh, chilies is something which can but chilies is also very much important uh, where I come from in Venda we strongly believe that eating quite a lot of chilies will fight against flu it will also help you against the flu so in other words you can use chilies for medicinal purposes. <laughs> So these animals, the elephants are one of those species which can be able to regurgitate water. If you look at the elephant here, if you look at the elephant here uh, on the mouth pass, the lower jaw, they, uh, after the lower jaw they've got a space like this. This is a sphyrengia porch. Sphyrengia porch is what is used in order to collect water. And when hearing the elephants making that sound of the sphyrengia porch is the one which amplifies that sound. That sound is not directly coming from the stomach. It co is coming from here. And Tristan is already lucky with uh, one of the cats. He's got the lions at the moment. And let's go see them by the Maasai Mara. Indeed, I am lucky, Sydney, because we have the most epic backdrop with our pride of lions. We've managed to find a few more of them that were kind of in this area. So the female was walking, and so we thought we'd come to this side, and we can actually see a whole lot that have just popped their heads up in front of us. I didn't even know half of them were there. But in front, next to that mound, as you can see, is a whole bunch of them that we didn't had no idea that were even around. So one, two, three, four, five, six of them that are sitting over there at least. There might even be more. So that's a lot of the sub-adults. Doesn't look like any adult females within that group, I don't think. And they're all just kind of having a bit of a look. But the storm is blowing in and you can see the lions are a lot more away, awake than when we first got you. Now if you look at this storm, what's going to happen is, is this should sweep in kind of and come along this escarpment. It often does. So it often comes along the escarpment here and it starts to then kind of rain along here and if it does that well then the conditions are right for lions because one is there's going to be wind which is going to make it very difficult for things like zebra um, or waterbuck or giraffe which are all around this area warthogs to hear anything the other thing is that you're going to get rain which makes it very difficult to see um, and so the lions then utilize that to their advantage it also gets a lot darker and so they blend in a little bit better and that could be the perfect kind of thing for them I'm just sad in some respects is that that buffalo herd is not still milling around. I'm sure it's the same herd that um, David has gotten. They must have gone back down towards the marsh area. Um, and I, it's a bit of a shame because in these conditions, lions, I think these lions would have had a crack at those buffalo. It would have been a really interesting kind of development and, and watching how they would have gone about it. Given that there's a lot of sub-adults here, I would have been intrigued to watch them try and hunt buffalo because I think it would have been a tough assignment for them. But isn't that beautiful? The light is seriously amazing. There's also a little bit of a rainbow that's just starting to develop now. So hopefully what we're going to get is we're going to get the typical kind of line in the open grassland, the big tree, and then the storm in the background with a bit of a rainbow forming. Wouldn't that be quite a spectacular kind of image? I hope that's what happens because I think it's absolutely beautiful. That kind of image right there for me is always an image of East Africa and it's kind of lure that it often has had but you can see the little male that's kind of walking off now but what you will notice with him too is also in need of food again it's amazing how fast they digest you wouldn't expect these guys to have killed two buffalo this week and still be in the shape that they're in um, you would have thought that they would have had nice big round tummies but it just goes to show how quickly these guys can digest buffalo when they um, have fed on it so hopefully this afternoon and I'll gamble to come here this afternoon will pay off So child of the universe, it is a big pride. It's 16 in total without the coalition males that are the ones that produce these cubs. Um, and it's the Olololo or Ngama pride. We used to call it the Ngama pride, but the, most of the guides here call it the Ololo, Olololo pride, which is the name of this escarpment that's in the background. So it provides the perfect backdrop for where they are. And what you'll probably find is I have a, I have a funny feeling that these guys are not going to hunt their way into 
um, the reserve. I think they're going to hunt their way up the escarpment, which obviously means we're not going to be able to follow them too far. But let's see how we how it plays out. I'm just going to catch up with those guys there for you, Manu, so you're not right on the longest end of your lens. Hopefully, the rest of them will slowly start to kind of come through. The rainbow is developing nicely, which is great news. So we should get a really nice rainbow and lion sort of storm. Be nice. All right, guys. One of you needs to sit on top of the mound now so that I can get you out of the grass. It will be a treat, Emma. Don't worry. We're going to line it up so that we can get this right. Because I don't know how long our rainbow is going to last. So let's try now while we've got it visible. I don't know if you guys can actually see it. It's very faint in the background there. So kind of going over the left-hand line is, is where that rainbow will roughly be. Um, there it is there so Manu is trying to kind of get it it's not bright 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 but hopefully it will brighten up and strengthen a little bit and then don't you think it will be absolutely beautiful to have rainbow lines in the long grass and that storm just kind of going across the plains I think it will be a wonderful kind of way to spend our afternoon I thoroughly am looking forward to hopefully watching them go about their business exactly that will do <laughs> But you can see they're definitely a lot more alert than what we had when we finished drive this morning. It's exactly what we thought they would do. It's just kind of rest up. And now when the weather starts to turn with the heat that we had today, it was bound to happen and start to now come into you know, their own and start to think about finding food and, and looking um, for any sort of sustenance that they can eat. So, Kathy, in, in Juma, you see them um, going for shelter very quickly. Um, there's waterbuck right up on the ridge that they probably are watching at the moment. Um, so, in Juma, you'll find they'll get under a thicket and they'll just kind of curl up in there. Here in the Mara, sometimes the nearest tree is quite far away, and so sometimes they just tough it out. They just sit there and they get pelted. Um, or they'll try and get to the nearest big tree, in which case they'll kind of get under and they'll just lie there. And, and I mean, they still get wet. There's really very little in the way of cover for a lot of the the cats out here they unfortunately unless they're very close to forested section they're going to just get wet and the problem with being in the forested areas is that those are very prone to a flash flooding effect um, and so it's actually not the great great place for them to be either so they just have to be tough and, and take it and they're so used to it these lions I mean they've been getting hit by rain for most of their lives now you'll see the last two that we left all the way back down there where we first started they're on their way so that's the young male and the little young female and they're kind of moving up towards us as well at the moment which is good so the whole pride should come together now if you want to know where the kind of kitchen male is he's pretty much directly across from where we are now so on just on the other side of the forest um, so if you look at those guys just on the other side of the forest area that's where the kitchen mail is at the moment we saw a whole bunch of cars there and I could see them through my binos when we drove past but I wanted to come to the side just to make sure these guys hadn't gone there as well um, now sorry I mean, if you can just repeat the name for me the wind is howling and I got the escarpment and animals living there but I didn't get the name so if you can repeat that deadly spunky that is that is quite the Twitter handle or handle whichever one it is on YouTube or Twitter but deadly spunky do any other do any animals live on the escarpment so primarily on the escarpment uh, not too many um, you you'll find Elant, uh, Reedbuck, um, like it up there quite a bit. Uh, they spend a lot of time there, although they do come down. Um, the lions go up there a lot, leopard up there a lot, um, zebras up and down, elephants at night, love the escarpment, but then come down during the day. Um, see, what else do we see going up and down? Impalas up and down a lot, baboons, they love it here. So this is a great place for baboons. They've got thickets where they can roost, then along the escarpments to feed during the day. Um, and I'm pretty sure you'll find very small animals. I'm pretty sure there's certain mouse species that will probably exclusively live just up in the rocky sections on the escarpment itself. Um, lots of different types of uh, birds that you see up there. So, or down into these forested sections. There we go. You see, we just have to talk and they will listen eventually. Um, Puma, Dick, Dick, exactly. They'll be up there. Um, there's two that live very close to our camp, funny enough, and you can see them most days if you look out for them. Um, so they're up. Um, and then, like I say, a few reptiles, a few different types of birds. There's actually a really beautiful snake that occurs up here that is called a Jamison's Mamba 
Um, so we get a black mamba, and there's one called a Jamisons, which is a, a beautiful greenish colored snake. Very, very pretty. And they occur in these forested sections up on the escarpment as well. So it's a great place to actually find them. And it's obviously very dangerous, but a very pretty snake. Um, what else is up in these areas? There have been reports in the, in the sort of forested sections of the escarpment of um, giant forest hog. Uh, but I, I mean I don't know I, I think that's a bit of a push a little bit now sorry what is that one ah you want to get a two shot sure no problem let me get Manu into a good place so Manu I like working with Manu because Manu's really creative when we're out here he likes to get really epic imagery and is constantly looking for um, nice ways to kind of show off all the animals that we see on a regular basis and new kind of techniques and and often comes up with some very very cool concepts so it's always cool to work with Manu because he often likes to do things um, differently and he, and he will ask and, and try and point things out which really helps to be able to get visuals like that where we can watch the oncoming members moving towards the rest of the pride isn't that cool so you can see them kind of striding towards the one up on the mound so well done Manu very good eyes there and good thinking but I'm glad they went up the mound they listened to us so we said to them they need to go up and sit on top there because we want the storm in the background and we want them and now the others approaching has just made it even that much better very very cool shot that here yeah, a bit of thunder in the background as well absolutely amazing How cool is this shot? This is very cool. Catherine Manu is a real artist, you're right. He, he, like I say, is very good with this kind of stuff. I thoroughly enjoy a lot of his um, footage that I've seen. I, I mean, I obviously don't have him worked with him as much as I probably would like to. And I, I would I would like to one day see Manu and Archie and James all come down to South Africa and start and do some filming of leopards and various other things. But they, Manu def, definitely has a good good way with the camera and, and incredibly fast with it. He's uh, taken a leaf out of Liam and, I mean, not Liam, Liam and Brian's book. Um, I don't know why I said Liam, um, VM and Brian's book, but um, as to, to kind of pace of movement with the camera and so obviously some of the cheetah hunts that Manu's filmed are on next level, so very, very cool. And we're fortunate, I mean, all of our cam ops have their strengths, they're all very good at what they do and as much as they we give them a lot of trouble, they are a professional bunch, they generally are the first guys on the vehicles things are always done well um, and then they really do strive to to make sure that they bring you the best images and I can promise you because we do reviews and various other things that they are as hard on each other and themselves as anybody could imagine and so you know they really do try to give you guys the best that we can possibly get given that it's a very difficult thing that they're doing you must remember that most documentaries that you guys are watching the cameraman are not having to worry at all about doing a live show they are having to just sit on the side of a car they generally the cars are built perfectly for filming um, and they're able to kind of get the camera as low as possible and they sit there and they have nobody moving the car it's just them normally um, they don't have to worry about anything now our cameramen have a, a, a camera that's probably not in the most ideal place for filming of wildlife it's great for the way we do our safari but obviously not in the way of filming wildlife and on top of that they've got these hooligan guides that move around and will shake and make their shots unsteady from time to time and really just cause havoc so you know they they have a tough time with us and and we you know we're very lucky that we do have the guys that we do so well done to all of our come up so don't think they get enough of a pat on the back at times that's for sure anyway how cool was that that was very very cool Manu you did well you can see the storm is now coming across and we're gonna get hit soon if you're looking straight ahead of us it's quite nice because you can actually see the sort of edge of the rain there on the sort of edge of the the hill as it's coming down you can see how the hill is slowly just but surely disappearing as the rain is coming towards us. So we will probably have to drop covers shortly. But in the meantime, let's send you back down to Sydney and see how he's getting on. So I am now heading much more towards the Chitwa area. I am driving just by the border between us and the Torchwood, which is the area where Hosanna went to yesterday. So I'm trying to check if he is back at the property or still by the uh, Torchwood side. 
but I have not yet picked up any convincing evidence about him going in or out. I didn't copy the uh, question uh, clearly, if you can repeat that, Emma. Alicia, uh, I am live from the western side of the Greater Kruger National Park now. So the show, it is an interactive live safari. As I'm talking now, you can talk to me. It's happening now. So let's hope to see Hosanna. That is also my hope uh, for this afternoon. And this is the area where I have seen Hosanna disappearing to the torch wood. And I've also met a hyena yesterday coming towards the same direction. You know, the hyenas, I am using them for orientation and navigation of the spotted cat these days. So now uh, I'm just going to uh, carry on and make a turn by the uh, Chitwa Chitwa waterhole and see if we cannot find any of the cat or any of the interesting animals in that area. I will come back later on here and listen, maybe we might hear Tingana sowing or we might be lucky and come across the fresh tracks of Wasana. The weather is now getting better is getting cool which is going to obviously encourage Osana to do some hunting as yesterday we left him hunting unless he already got a kill at the moment But he was so hungry yesterday afternoon, so I'm sure maybe already he got something small or something big. And if it's something big towards the torch wood, it's going to be difficult for me to see him for a couple of days. So let's hope he caught something on our side. So there's quite a lot of impalas in the area where we are at the moment. A lot of impalas in the area and when there's too much impalas like this, it gives me a lot of confidence that uh, the spotted cats might be around. So we might be lucky as per your request and see the hyenas. I will also try and visit the den maybe during the final stage of the game drive. Uh, we do see cheetahs, uh, call six here in Juma. It's just that the sightings for those kind of beautiful cats are very much rare, but we do see them. So I just want to check some tracks here. Craig, my professional camera operator, spotted something. I just want to uh, see what is it that he has just spotted now. So he has just spotted some lion tracks. I just want to confirm uh, where these tracks are heading to. Maybe we can be able to see these tracks from here. So there is uh, some uh, lion tracks uh, somewhere here and we, we, we're just going to try and go to the nearest waterhole which is the Chito Chito. Maybe we might be lucky when we get there. Otherwise I've got to come back and carry on by the Juma side.
Nico Nico viewer, the lions, they've got a very good eyesight, both during the daytime and at night. Those kind of animals at night can see very well. What helps the animals which are much more active during the night to see well is the following. If you look at the lions, not only the lions, together with the leopards and other cats, sometimes dogs as well, you will see they've got the whiskers here. Those whiskers are called Vabriciae. Those whiskers are not there just for a decoration. They are there to serve a very significant purpose because they are connected with a uh, the brain. They can be able uh, to pick up uh, what is coming in front and measure the space in within the trees as they are walking at night. So those whiskers are connected with the nervous coordination which then conveys, which is getting the message from the brain in order to alert the animal about the surrounding at night. And some birds as well, they do have uh, those kind of uh, whiskers. It's just that they are not called whiskers by the birds. So we are now slowly approaching uh, the uh, Chitra Chitra water hole. You can see right in the middle of the road we have got the Egyptian gill which is saving as a big sign that we are not far away from the water hole. So there is an Egyptian goo now. It's uh, a few of them crossing to the bushes there. They're just about a uh, few kilometers, few meters away from uh, the water hole. Maybe it's uh, approximately a kilo. So they are leading us to the Chitra Chitra water hole at the moment, where we are hoping to see something interesting this afternoon. So it's nice to hear the way. The Egyptian goose has just led by one small water point. But this is not uh, the uh, Chitra Chitra water hole where they are. I will show you where they are, just here they are. Now those kind of areas where we're seeing, you can see they're leaving a small uh, water point there. That water point uh, probably has been uh, designed by the elephant. That's why that water point does not have a shape because elephants, when they come, they don't worry about the uh, shape of the water point. What they do is to dig the ground and it, the ground starts collecting water and they come for mud wallowing. A rhino come to the very same area. Watchdogs, you'll see them there. And suddenly, this is going to be a very big uh, natural water hole. So next Naturally, animals, they do try and create their own water holes. It's just that the water holes which are dug by the animals don't necessarily meet the requirements for predation because a predation needs quite a lot of thick bushes nearby so that they can be able to hide when the animals are coming to drink. So when it's done naturally like this, you can see it's much more open. At least there is a termite mound here and some of the trees which can assist some of the predators to come and wait for it.
Welcome back everybody. Sorry that we have a few gremlins. Unfortunately, the way things are with storms on this side and there's a few issues in Juma, but we have the most epic, epic scene. Look at this. Isn't that everything that you could have asked for? You've got a rainbow, lions at the bottom of it, big tree on the right, East Africa right there spoiling us better than we could ever ever imagine is that not sensational I think so I think it's possibly one of the most kind of epic sort of scenes I've seen in quite some time so really really beautiful and we are fortunate that the rainbow is just kind of somehow lined up exactly with this lion that's on top of this mound so we've been spoilt in in this regard and I'm super excited that we managed to actually get it live because I was a bit worried at one point I thought maybe just maybe we were gonna have a bit of an issue and that we weren't gonna get it right but we've managed somehow to sort everything out while our tech geniuses have and so we're back with you now Emma has suggested a very good idea that it's probably a good time for a one word tweet as to what you think of that image right there I think it's pretty spectacular so I want to know from you guys what your one word tweet is for that yes Emma sometimes you have moments of brilliance and now again you guys see that there's a second rainbow forming as well so it's not just one rainbow there's actually two of them that are forming which is whew, quite something we like I say are being spoiled by the fact that we have that kind of shot right there and it's everything I was hoping it would be I was really really kind of hoping that we were gonna get a really epic sky and then one of them on the mound I didn't quite expect to get a beautiful rainbow as strong as colored as that but you know we you risk it you gamble it and that's what you kind of get I for me that's absolutely beautiful Andy, you say, wow, double rainbow, lion, cuddle, puddle. I agree, isn't it something? And the noise of the storm as well, while it's, we're kind of sitting here. So far, we haven't got wet. Pretty sure we're about to get absolutely drenched. Manu and I have risked it. We've decided we're going to go for the, the risk and we're going to keep the, the rain covers off for now. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to probably not be very impressed with ourselves just now when we have to scramble when the rain really does come down. But it seemed like a worthwhile risk, doesn't it? I don't know, what do you guys think? Devo, you say awesomeness? Yes, well, there's not very much else you can say about something like this, is there? It is awesomeness at its very best, for me at least. I think it's very, very cool. I'm thoroughly thrilled that we managed to get it for you guys more than anything else like I say I was getting a bit kind of stressed because I was thinking sure with the kind of gremlins and lions on a mound and rainbows that doesn't really exactly last all that long and so we're gonna cut it fine in terms of being able to show you but somehow some way it all pulled together and we ended up with what we wanted which is perfect so very 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 fortunate to have gotten that now hopefully we'll get one more that will kind of go up onto the mound you can see everyone's kind of looking around and sort of listening and Eremi you say magical yes and you can see why it's called the magical Mara isn't it when you get scenes like that from time to time it gives you an idea of why it gets given that name that's for sure it, it really is a special place when these kind of things happen from a scenery point of view you know Juma's got many 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 am amazing things about it from a scenic point of view though I don't know if it quite compares to the Mara in terms of just the vistas that you get um, there's, there's parts of Juma that are pretty but not quite as pretty as this because often in Juma you, you get very obscured when it comes to a storm like this um, and the rainbows and all that kind of stuff whereas here you've just got the such clean view that kind of goes out that it really is quite spectacular so very fortunate you know, to be able to kind of bring these to you and it's, it complements Juma so nicely I think in many respects because of its kind of open nature it's predator rich it's it's a predators that we don't see maybe as much at Juma that it really allows us to kind of work hand in hand with that and I, I like the combination of the two I think they provide balance um, which is nice I mean I know a lot of you are uber Juma fans and not so much not, 
Tom said, great job getting the lines to cooperate. Well, I, you know, it wasn't me, really. I, it was, it's all thanks to Manu making us move. It's the only reason I saw it is because actually we were sitting here and then it just started to kind of develop and we just slightly positioned ourselves better and we managed to kind of get it right. So we can actually thank Manu for all of this. He was the one that got this all kind of into the right space. But for me, that was absolutely beautiful. I'm hoping the way the wind is blowing, we might, might, just squeak out of this and, and get lucky and not get ruet. I somehow don't think it's going to happen, um, but you never know. We might get lucky here. It seems to be blowing across us slightly rather than towards us. Ellie, as you can see, petrified. They are nervous. No, the, the lions here are so used to thunder and lightning, you can see they're not too stressed. I think if a crack of lightning had to hit right here next to us and and you know be very close to them yes they would probably jump and run a little bit but you must remember like i say for them this is par for the course almost daily you get these thunderstorms like this somewhere in the mara so these guys get quite used to the fact that rain is part and parcel of their life um, and and so you'll find that they're not that phased by it you can see half of them are still sleeping they're not even actually worried too much about thunder and lightning and we can hear a lot of thunder and lightning already coming our way so oh there's some giraffe as well isn't that pretty there's some giraffe that are coming from behind the lions at the moment roxy they are my pots of gold now wouldn't it be something now we're going to throw this out there because why not we, we're living the dream as it is. What if these giraffe walk behind the lions? Rainbow, giraffe, lions. Like in a little constant teen effect. I think that'll be pretty something. I think it'll be really, really nice. That'll be winning, I think, exactly. Something from the Lion King. The problem is, is that the rain is going to start. So what I might do is actually just turn us around so that what I can do is have the back flaps and one side down and we can still watch what goes on because the storm will come in from the left so if I'm the way that I am I'm gonna have a bit of a trouble to get it right so just give me two seconds just to turn around quickly and then I can drop one side and we won't have too much of an issue so I do apologize Right, so while we do that and while we sort ourselves out, I'm going to send you quickly across to Sydney and see how he's doing battling his gremlins. Hopefully, he's going to get it right. I am still looking uh, for the spotted cats here. I am now just around the Chitwa Chitwa doing trekking by all means, but still no sign of any of these leopards in this area. So where I am is a suitable area for trekking, but I am not seeing any evidence here showing that uh, uh, this uh, cat has been here. So I'm just trying to uh, investigate one of the tracks here, but I saw it was uh, a track from one of the dogs. So the only animal I'm seeing at the moment here is the guinea fowls. Let's see, uh, the guinea fowls are also having uh, something to eat here at the moment. So the guinea fowls, uh, they nest on the ground, but for safety, you will see them high up by the trees. So look at what these guinea fowls are doing. That's why they called their group of guinea fowls is called a confusion. You can see they're just running everywhere, confusing at the moment. With the spots on their feathers, uh, this helps them in order to confuse their predators. They also do get predated. Sometimes big cats, such as the leopards, do predate this kind of birds. So you can see they can run very fast. Look at that. So by this time of the year is when the guinea fowls are having the tapeworms. We can eat the guinea fowls. We just got to be very careful because by the month with letter R is when they've got quite a lot of uh, tapeworms in the stomach. So eating the guinea fowls by this time of the year can uh, jeopardize uh, you when it comes to the tapeworms. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Mrs. Lepwing, uh, the guineas are so pretty. You can see they are joined by a, a hammer cop. So the hammer cop is somewhere on the right side there. So they are both feeding together. So guinea fowls are some of those birds which will always give you an alarm call. And then it's very easy to distinguish their call from the rest of the birds. They don't have same call. They've got different kind of calls. And when they're not happy about something, they are going to be vocal and making use of a very unique call. <laughs> Francis, uh, the guinea fowls, the eggs, they are good to eat uh, because these kind of birds, uh, quite a lot of African tribes, they do eat uh, their eggs. So their eggs are not bad to eat. We can eat them. So now uh, let's uh, cross over to the Masai Mara where Tristan is having one of the tallest animals. I do indeed. I've got the tallest of the tall that have moved in and they're just watching proceedings with the, the lions at the moment. They are not too stressed though because you can see the lions well, they haven't even noticed the giraffe yet, I don't think. So it's all just a case of them having a bit of a nap. Everybody's fairly relaxed at this stage and I don't think in all likelihood these lions would hunt these giraffe just given the fact that there's not really any young giraffe there those are all quite large um, if there was a small baby then yes then I think we might see you know the lions get a little bit more kind of interested but with just the size of those giraffe I think they'll watch them but I don't think they'll actually have a real go at them to be honest isn't it beautiful though can see the giraffe have seen the lions they fully aware that there are lions around and that's why they're just slowly kind of walking along making sure that there's no others that are close by every now and then gazpacho difficult to know how many times they hunt a week because um, it is variable some weeks they'll hunt a lot more some weeks a lot less so when the migration is here sometimes they'll kill indiscriminately and kill six seven eight nine wildebeest a night for the whole week other times like now they might have a lean week where they only get a buffalo and that lasts them for the entire week so it's difficult to say but generally what we from kind of statistically speaking every sort of three days is what we'll see from these guys in terms of actual hunting um, and well, I mean, in terms of, of meal, if you had to average it all out, three-ish days, but sometimes more, sometimes less. I, for me, you know, lions are, are animals that will hunt whenever the opportunity comes their way. So, and a big pride like this probably hunts more regularly than others because there's so many miles to feed that even if they bring down something like a zebra, they're still going to have to try their best to get f more food to be able to sustain everybody so it just depends on kind of the individual pride and, and the structures that you have very special though what we have witnessed this afternoon not from a kind of behavioral point of view but just from a from a aesthetic point of view I think is the probably the best word for this for me it's kind of one of those very very special sightings in many respects the light is very very pretty isn't it now you'll see look at that isn't that special very very cool well I think so like I say I mean you guys don't have to agree with me but that's how I think I think it's as good as it gets and well worth us coming here if I'm honest for me it's well at least I have Sebastian, in certain areas, yes, um, giraffe are high up on the menu and will be chased by lions regularly. Um, just depends on the area that the lions live in and what potential food items they possibly face. And so, you know, here there's a lot of other species that they can go after that are potentially easier. Remember, a giraffe is a massive animal and can be dangerous and difficult to get to in open plains like this. Tall, 
good eyesight, can see lions coming when the grass is short like this, and so tricky to get close to them. Um, but in certain areas, for sure, I mean, there's prides. There were in the, the mountain pride, which was on the sort of eastern side of the Kruger National Park, a little bit north of uh, Sabi Sands, if you had to draw a straight line to the Mozambique boundary. The mountain pride at one point, so they were almost 40, I think 42 lions, somewhere there. Um, and they were hunting giraffe almost every day um, because that was sustaining them, and there was a large population of giraffe so it really just depends on the animal um, depends on the environment that it's in its food availability all of those kind of factors will dictate um, whether giraffe are a key kind of component in a lion's diet but Manu is doing sterling work isn't that quite something what amazes me about that is that a giraffe is a huge creature and it is being dwarfed by those skies that we've got this afternoon so it gives you an idea of just kind of how big the clouds and how kind of open it feels sometimes when you're here and and that's the kind of things that people come a long way to see is those kind of moments right there gary um in terms of how big giraffe groups get also very variable um here in the mara tend to be a little bit larger than what we see from um, the Juma, the Juma kind of groups. Um, although in the Sabi Sands I have seen a group of 17. Um, here though, you tend to be a lot more. Here you tend to see groups of sometimes even as much as 20, which is obviously quite a lot. Now it is starting to rain, so what I want to just do, sorry guys, I've parked a little bit poorly for the rain. I had parked because of the, the, the rainbow, but what I'm going to do is just need to just turn us down a little bit because the way that I've got our covers set up, if I have us a little bit more like that which actually helps Manu and helps him be open up the giraffe and the lions a little bit then we're we'll able to kind of keep the rain from coming on us at all we don't actually have to worry one bit now because we've got one side of the car that's completely closed so as long as the rain doesn't come from the opposite direction which it shouldn't given the way it's been coming all afternoon then we should be okay oh I've just spotted another lioness very far in the distance, man. You see her all the way down. Now, I don't know if she's part of the pride because there was no lions that we saw move in that direction. Way off in the distance, there's a lion that is kind of sitting there watching this grouping, which is interesting. I wonder because where we are now could very well be the Owino Pride. Uh, I mean, the Owino Pride that could be here as well. So it might even be one of them that's around, which is intriguing. So I'm wondering what she's going to do. She's just popped out now that the rain has started to fall. It's definitely none of the members that we saw this morning because pretty much all of them are accounted for. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12 although we did have 13 this morning so maybe actually she's sneaked off and kind of gotten somewhere down that side but interesting she's giving herself a little shake because of the rain that's falling you might be able to hear the rain that's kind of hitting the roof at the moment now the one thing we do have to be very careful of here which is um, is lightning so as much as the i don't mind rain lightning is obviously a very big threat it's also a massive threat to our equipment so we need to be a bit careful if the lightning gets any closer we're going to have to make a bit of a call but we'll see so far we're okay let's just see how we go just a few strikes right well i'm gonna just see how this lightning goes we'll just see how we kind of pan out but i'm going to send you across to sydney who's still looking for the elusive spots of juma We're now leaving the uh, Chitra Chitra waterhole area, going back to Juma. As this side, uh, the signs are not here, and we have just seen the signs on the other side of the lions. I want to go and take it from where my camera operator spotted those uh, lion tracks. Maybe our luck is on the Juma side. So here I have checked all the roads 
I did a loop around the water hole and there's still no sign of any of the predator. Quite a lot of impalas in the area. So you can so you can see that predators are concentrating much more towards the Juma side than uh, this side of Chitwa Chitwa. So somewhere here is where we saw those tracks. <laughs> uh, Barbara, that is what I'm hoping for. I am trying to hit the two beds with one stone because the very same area where the lion tracks are is where Osana got disappeared yesterday. And there's still no sign of Osana and no updates on Osana since yesterday. So somewhere here is where we have lost the tracks of uh, that uh, lion. Let me just uh, check the ground uh, thoroughly. Uh, Call 6, unfortunately we haven't picked up any buffalo tracks yet. So these lions might be maybe after uh, any kind of a game in the area. Yes, their special preference is the buffaloes, but they do go and hunt for something different. So the tracks are heading much more at that side. Uh, thank you very much uh, the good news maybe i might bring you some good news with these cats <laughs> okay. so somewhere here <laughs> thank you So here where we are, uh, the weather is fine, it's unlike the Mara at the moment. Yes, on our side as well, the weather is building. We might get some rain maybe tonight or tomorrow. Uh, rain is always unpredictable. This morning early, there was a little bit of uh, a shower and we are hoping for more rain in the next two to three weeks. So Tristan and my other colleagues in the Masai Mara, they are now in the middle of the rain. <laughs> so I've got uh, an Impala here at the moment. This Impala looks very healthy. He's one of the members of this bachelor head. I am seeing a bachelor head because all the members I'm seeing here are carrying horns. So impalas, you will see them forming the breeding heads, which is consisted of the females and one breeding male uh, is a harem, and you will see them also in bachelor heads. Young ones of the same age, you will see them forming a crash, and some, they become part of the nazari head. Uh, this is a nice impala shot and thank you very much Craig. Look at those black markings at the back and also the black markings on the hind legs. Uh, this is quite a gorgeous animal. So you can see the impala has got the three different uh, Uh, Gary, I agree this is a nice impala. Look at the side of the bodies. You can see those three colors which break these animals into three dimensional shapes.
this confuses the predators the most. You know, the animals, they employ the anti-predatory strategies. Uh, normally, these anti-predatory strategies are part of what is called crisis, which is just a strategy employed by the animals to avoid the detection by the predator. These strategies are not perfect because mostly they can only work when the animal is not moving. Once the animal starts moving, is going to destroy the strategy and the predator is going to be able to see it. So the animals such as the zebras, those ones are clever because they employ something called a dazzle motion or it's called a motion dazzle, dazzle motion where when they are running is when they are confusing the predators. So they don't use that strategy when they are stationary. When they are running, the stripes dazzles, and when the stripes are doing that, then they give the predator a contradictory directional signals. So they get confused on where this animal is, is going, and it's always very difficult for a predator to single one out. So now uh, let's uh, cross over to the Masai Mara where a uh, Christ Tristan, not Christian, uh, Tristan is enjoying uh, the lions in the rain. Indeed, we do. Uh, the rain is starting to fall and our poor lions, as you can see, heads are starting to go into that typical lion fashion where they start to droop a little bit and they kind of look through squinted glances and their ears get sort of tucked in a certain way. Um, and they look very unhappy with life so that's where we're at at the moment poor guys are getting rained on and you can see what we were talking about earlier everyone was asking about rain and whether or not they move or do they not like it you can see it's raining now and they haven't moved at all so they haven't run to the tree they just know that it's part and parcel so they just sit here they take it and then they hope that once it's done they can wake up and start to kind of move around the lioness that was far in the distance still hasn't joined i can't see her anymore but she hasn't arrived here so that's going to be interesting to see whether or not she does start to move in this direction and then there still is one lioness that is way, not with the group at the moment but the rain is pelting down and for now these guys are sitting i think if we had had a buffalo herd here now i reckon we would have maybe seen some action um and seen them starting to try and go after them they often do hunt buffalo in the rain but with nothing really around other than those giraffe which we've discussed is not really on the list for the ololos as, as big giraffe go i mean if it was a small giraffe maybe so they're gonna i think wait it out and as it gets a little darker and after the rain is gone then i think we're gonna start to see these guys um moving about and and starting to kind of look for for some sort of food which would be nice um but for now sleepy Ladybirds, not that I've ever picked up, to be honest with you. I mean, they, they do have a, a slight smell to them, but not as strong as a wet dog. Um, it's not, they're not hugely smelly. Um, it's funny, you, often people think, you know, when you're sitting around lions and all kinds of animals, actually, hyena, lion, um, wild dogs, wild dogs are smelly, but the rest are not actually smelly at all. Unless they've been feeding on an old carcass, then they, they take on the smell of the carcass um, or they're passing gas, but otherwise they don't smell like wet dog. Um, well, certainly not strong enough that we can pick up uh, from the vehicle itself. You know, at the moment these cats are probably, I would say, about 10 to 15 meters away from me at the moment. And so, you know, the smell from there to here with the rain, I won't pick it up at all. I'd have to really like go close and probably touch it to activate that smell. And maybe then it would have that sort of scent. But from where I'm sitting now and the way that we are, no, not at all. I can't smell any sort of wet dog. Um, smell and I have never smelt it really on lions before there's a slight maybe a slight kind of I don't know what the smell is but it's not wet dog smell there's a slight smell to it but it's not it's not what you would think often also remember when it rains in Africa you get the smell of soil and things like that which often overpowers these guys at the distances that we're at I think if we had to like I say go and rub up on them we'd probably get that smell a lot more Ah, oh, the pitter patter of rain, a typical Mara afternoon, that's for sure. Quite lucky that we can actually sit and still film in this because this is quite tricky conditions for a lot of, um, for Juma and even if the, if the lightning starts then unfortunately we have to shut it down, but for now we're all good. Marcy, 
Well, you ask a question that's unfortunately only one person can really kind of attest to, and that is, Molly, well, he is the only one out of all of our presenters to have seen wild dogs in the Maasai Mara. Um, so yes, they are here. There's a pack that's in Tanzania and a pack that's in northern conservancies of the Mara, and sometimes, very, very rarely, do they make an appearance in the triangle and after two years of being here basically or a year and eight months if you want to call it that um Molly was the one that actually got the wild dogs um running up the escarpment which he was very excited about and i thought he did a sterling effort given it was the first time he had gone live um i thoroughly enjoyed it his excitement was infectious and so the answer to it is yes but with with caution that it is very rare Fair enough? Yes, I think that would be um, a fair statement. Yes, fair. There we go. Emma gives me the seal of improvement, and if you get the improvement, um, and then you know all is good. So I believe a lot of you are saying that your cats get very smelly when they get wet. So the thing is, is that I, I would like to know from many of you, do you smell your cats um before they kind of before you touch them or do you just smell them because you get up close to them it's an interesting thing because lions like i say we obviously the di the distance that we're at very few people would be able to probably smell their cats at the distance that or we're at at the moment from these lions so if i had to put your cat from where i'm sitting i highly doubt that i would smell them maybe maybe not maybe i would uh, i'm not quite sure the interesting thing though is that um you know there obviously is a scent to them and and maybe somebody that's ever i don't know um worked with lions before i'll have to ask some vets whether or not in rain when they when they touch them that they can smell them but in mean, the lions that i've been fortunate enough to have worked with in terms of vets starting and and checking and those kind of things um you can touch them but ne generally you always touch them with gloves and so that smell is never really on your hands it's not like wild dogs wild dogs when you do work around them um, if you touch them and you put that on your clothes that smell just doesn't come out of your clothes for days and you have to wash it a few times until it starts to come out and your hands as well so you know they are a lot more smelly than what the lions are unless the lions like i say have been eating a rotten carcass if they've been eating a rotten carcass well then you you tickets like <laughs> they smell horrendous So, Crystal, you say your cat doesn't smell like anything when it's wet compared to a dog. Well, in my experience, and the cats that I've um, had in my life, that would be the same for me. I don't really recall um, my cats smelling um, like wet anything, really. Maybe a little bit. I just can't remember. Giraffe you say you never really smell your cats. Now, Giraffe that would be if anybody else was listening to this conversation and wasn't really paying attention to what has been going on and just took that as a one-liner. It would be a rather awkward thing to explain is that I never really smell my cats. It's a kind of weird one-liner that people might just kind of look at you a bit funny as to say, why are you talking about smelling your cats anyway? What are you doing that you're picking up and smelling your cat? Um, so, you know, funny things that we talk about on, well, it's on Safari Live is often get into these funny conversations but I'm glad that you don't smell your cat I'm sure your cat's quite happy knowing cats they don't really like to be picked up and smelt a lot of them Jocelyn have you got is Jocelyn has gone off to go smell her cats but now Jocelyn I want to know one thing before you go and smell your cat you can't just pick up and smell your cat because you've you know just decided you want to smell it and it's dry the experiment has to be that the cat has got to be wet now anyone who has ever tried to wet a cat will know very well that that's not a very good idea for the most part there is the odd cats out there that's not too phased but most cats don't like to be wet so i'm intrigued to see how this goes and whether or not you're successful in the fact that you can smell your cat unless of course it's been raining where you are um and then of course you will be able to do it but otherwise your experiment is going to be a bit flawed or you're going to make your cat wet and that's going to be uh, probably detrimental to some form of your body where it's going to get clawed at some point so let us know how it goes um, and if there is any clawing that takes place um, send us a photo it will be quite funny to see what your cat actually looks like and if you do wet your cat the faces of a wet cat is generally quite miserable so a screenshot of your cat would be quite funny as well
but hopefully you're not going to wet your cat. Don't wet your cat. Cats don't like to be wet. You can see these cats are not too wet. They'll shake off all of them just now, though, and you'll find a lot of water will come off them. It's better when the males do it because they get the manes and the manes get a lot wetter, but these guys are pretty cool to, to see as well. Right, well, our lions slowly stirring so while we see if they're gonna wake up let's send you back across to Sydney and see if he's had any luck with his lions or leopard I am still busy trekking for uh, these cats and it is quiet here where I am and no tracks on the road at all all I'm seeing are old tracks for this morning. A lot of hyenas activities here showing that hyenas has been here. Maybe these hyenas were after the lepers. So these days is going to be very difficult to spot an animal from the bushes without seeing the track first. So maybe we might be lucky with some of the fresh tracks. I'm going to try the Mulawat area, Twinsdam area. Can pick up a very strong smell. A child of the universe, the lions don't specifically target an animal. After the buffalo, they target, they prefer something which is heavier than 550, kilo, uh, uh, 550 kilograms. So if something is uh, larger than 550 kilograms uh, is preferred by uh, the lions. So in other words, lions, they first check the size of the group. If they see that the size of the pride uh, is 10 like the Unkuhumas or 11, they know they must have to duck at something big so that everyone can get satisfied. Here comes the problem. Lions, they know if they don't target something big to satisfy everybody, it is going to be like a fruitless exercise. They don't want to lose much energy in order to get a little bit of food. They want to chase something big and lose energy in order to gain back the energy they have lost. And I think it's a good idea. So now uh, I am going to send you to the Masai Mara where David is also looking for something in the rain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can say I have a smile on my face because for the last 30, 40 minutes, me and Archie has been hammered by very heavy storms. And at one point, we just had to stop the vehicle. You can see how it great it looks. We stopped the vehicle and we do not know where to go, left or right. But at least you see we've just brought all the flaps down. We are still surviving. We are still in business. And where we are now is a lot better. Well, in the process of us being hammered by the rain, we saw black rain, unfortunately. That was my mission for today. But also the rain was also equally confused like us because she kept running hard till up. And these are some of the things that will happen when the weather just changes drastically. Now, we have elephants at the moment, and what will happen is, unlike other animals which panic or which go in a bit of confusion when it rains, out of my many years in the bush, I have noticed elephants, they just keep doing their thing. If they were feeding, they'll just keep feeding. The only one time I see elephants slow down, stall, is in the mid of the heat of the day, and especially if they have young calves like that when you see there they might look for some shade under some huge trees but when it's just no more cold temperatures rain or no rain the elephants are always on the move and that translates to elephants being my favorite animals because it's very unusual to see an elephant just doing nothing and just like boring you and not doing an action well remember 
This is a very interactive safari we are on, regardless of the rain. Should you have any comments or any questions, where are you, why is the training, where you are, and where Tristan is, we'd be happy to talk to you. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Well, I was talking earlier, saying these are the short trains, but it would happen, they might turn out to be, again, long rains like what we had early in the year. And when we stopped with Archie at one point, not sure I had a little clip of the rain there. I don't know that you want to come to me for a couple of seconds. I'm not sure this, the viewers can see that. Is that good, Archie? Yeah, Emmy the final control says, oh my goodness, that's source one, and before things got better. Well, the visibility at one point was even poor. We could not even move. And we stuck in that one area and we thought we're going to stay here until things get better and go out. So what we did, we have, did, we have done a very big detour. Crystal, very good comment. And you're saying it's raining elephants and buffaloes and not cats and dogs. That's a great comment. I've always wanted to use the same comment because this is not what we call cats and dogs. This truly is elephants and buffaloes, or we might say giraffes and rhinos, just like the one rhino we saw there. Well, the thing is, the back in business is not as heavy as it was before. Visibility is still not as good, so we're going to be maybe assembling our infrared maybe in a few minutes if it doesn't get any better, and finding out what you might see on the road. Jump. Do we get tornadoes or those kind of very big storms? Luckily, in Africa, we do not. We do not get tornadoes. We do not get those natural lightnings. But sometimes when it rains, we get very heavy rains. And what happens is when the rains are very heavy, they damage the infrastructure, roads and communication, it breaks, breaks down. But we luckily do not get tornadoes in Africa. Not really like what maybe people would get in North America. So actually I'm counting on you to spot game for me because at the moment my visibility is almost less than 10%. I can only see about five meters in front of me. And you also notice our cars have almost no, uh, what do you call them, the, the, the wipers on the windshield because we always tilt the windshield you know, on the bonnet. Paula, I'm very careful, Paula, and always very good to hear your name. And uh, hopefully, Paula, you can see I have my shuka there. So what I'm doing today, I am staying on the big road. I'm not sure to call it M25. I am not leaving this highway. I will stick here until the drive is over. But the biggest mistake or the biggest risk I'm going to do is try to deviate and come out of the road to go get close to an animal. What happens here? in the Mara, the geology of the Mara, the soil here, it's very sticky. We have what you call the black cotton soil. And if it rains, that one can put you in a lot of trouble. So possibly stay on the big road where they got some nice, you know, compact soil that just keeps you afloat and you don't want to sink. Last night I was stuck for about 10 minutes on the last night uh, on the evening game drive. So not just surely, but the times you have seen cats come on the road when train so heavily and the grass become very wet. Lions in general or the cheetahs, for example, they do not like the wetness of the grass and they tend to come to the road. I'll bet the road also being wet, they prefer staying on the road than in the grass. Hi. Personally, when enjoying the rain, it's turning everything green and everything turns green. The happy boys have every, every reason to celebrate. The cuts the same. And I'm hoping these rains 
are still in Serengeti National Park, where we're looking at another two and a half months or so, they will be bringing down their babies. It's around the month of February. All the tall grass that was here a couple of months ago, they came in the big multitudes and the lawn mowed everything and the grass at the moment is very short. The only animals enjoying the animals or the grass would be the buffaloes, giraffes, eland and some other smaller antelopes. Well, I'm not sure how the weather looks like in South Africa with Sydney and I'm sure he might be trying to get a leopard or a can of some cut. David, here where I am, the bush is also completely green and this bush was fast to recover. Everything is green and is very much thick at the moment. I am trying my luck to see if we are going to attack any of the cats this afternoon. I have just been in the twins dam now now where except for the Egyptian goose every each and every water hole here in Uh, sorry for the apologies for the inconvenience. We are experiencing some technical issues. We will be back just now. <laughs> the signals are coming and going and coming and going. So now. Uh, let's see, maybe we might. Oh, look at that. Oh, we got an owl. Look at that. Oh, that owl decided. Oh, another one there. Oh, they were all sitting here and they've just uh, left just now. So it was the uh, two owls. I'm not too sure what they were busy with. And so now let's uh, go to the Maasai Mara where David is waiting. Well, Sydney, some of these things will happen. And I remember at one point today, I lost my signal. I had some technical issues. You'd imagine what we do in terms of technology to get us to your screen back home there is quite uh, a, a complex way of doing things. Personally, I enjoy the rain and I have nothing against the rain. Where I come from any day or where I come from in my village, any day the rain should come. Uh, my mother would tell, you know, why do you look so excited today? And I would tell her, I can see the clouds building and the clouds building would maybe translate some rains later. And when it would rain, all of us would go out with all the other boys. And what we used to do, we would run and just stop in the middle of the mud and just slide, you know. And it was so funny, we would compete for who would slide more than the other. And the only challenges, or the challenges were, you go back home with a few injuries here and there. We used to get very big beatings from our parents and like, what did you do? Where did you go, you know? Those are the things that would happen then, and even today, I still enjoy the rain. Yes, and um, you know, in the final control says that was quite some fun, but apparently no gas. So for instance, you say you love the rain too, and who would not love the rain? When you think what rain translates into, I mean, everybody should, you know, love the rain. Like the locals here, where we come from in the villages where we need to go to the rivers or streams to get the water, when it dries up, it's a challenge for the, you know, the villagers there. 
because it will mean them going longer distances to go to the bigger rivers to get the water. But if it rains, it's all green. We have so many streams to most villages in Africa where they can easily go and fetch water either for cooking or for laundry. I'm still hoping to see some lions or some cats of some sort on the road because the surface is much drier than the grass which looks pretty wet for me now or maybe get some elephants walking on the road the giraffes also don't get very bothered by the rain the zebras are still fine with that it's mainly most of the animals that have long fur because they don't want any water the fur does not feel or they don't feel very good if their fur hold lots of water I would imagine also the cats, like lions, should get maybe pneumonia or they would get some infection or a cold. Once in a while we have been out on a drive. There's a particular pride of lions that I call the sausage tree pride that I really love. They're my favorite. And there are times when I'm watching them, I have noticed the cubs once in a while just sneezing. You know, they would sneeze or cough. And I would imagine is when maybe they inhale a lot of cold air or when it gets very cold at night or if it rains definitely is not very healthy for them big animals i would say like the buffaloes i don't think they have issues you know with the rain that should be good for them david very good question and apparently we share the same name and i'm sure that's one of the best names in the world I have ever heard of and you want so the annual rainfall in Amara it's about a thousand millimeter annually it's about 1000 millimeter that's the annual rainfall in Amara but I would say this year we might be going one and a half times that maybe 1500 millimeter rain David uh, this year because the rains uh, when we had the long rains March April May and June and they were very very heavy we had very few trucks that would come out David and do a game drive and what you call the short rains now, to me, are equivalent to the normal long rains that we get every year. So if we double that, or we say one and a half times, we might end up with about 1,500 millimeter of rainfall this year. But we'll still see, we still got about 20 more days or 15 days to the end of the year. All right, any lions on the road here? Or any hyenas? Not much, so what it do? In Gora, you're asking, does it ever get so wet? And the safari vehicles have issues. Yes, like the months I'm talking about, June, July, it was so bad, so bad, because the vehicles, most of the safari tourists had to stay on the big roads like this. And they would watch, say, lions or cheetahs from a distance and they only had to use their far lookers or binoculars. A few guides who thought, well, they would take a risk. Some of them were stuck for hours and hours, you know, because you had to wait for a big grader to come and tow them out. And there are times when even those graders would try to tow those vehicles out. And what would happen is it was very difficult and the tow of the use, they would snap. So they ended up putting the tourists on top of those graders. And I'm imagining something like an open tractor with, you know, the tourists holding their handbags, their passes and their binoculars being brought to a bigger road like this. And then they would be fetched by another vehicle back to the camp, you know. Of course, the guide also would accompany them and they'll go back to the camp, either have a long breakfast or stay in, have lunch and wait for a day or two to go back and tow the vehicle out. Yeah, it was very tough. It was very tough. Hopefully it doesn't get to that level uh, this time around. We highly doubt. But you're waiting to hear from the meteorological department and they're going to tell us how it will be. But I can tell you for a fact, the last five, ten years, uh, the weather pattern here has been quite erratic. Very difficult to, to say tomorrow this is what we expect. Next week this is what we expect. No, no, no. Sometimes you just wait and play by the ear. Well, it had started to subside, but it's like coming back again. But so long as I stay on the big road, I'll still be in business. 
very good. You know, keep fingers crossed, doesn't get pretty bad. But as I say, the good news is the surface on this road is very compact soil and everything's pretty fine. Eh? This doesn't worry me a minute. What would happen if it gets very big and we get thunderstorms or lightning, we may only have to power down and wait for things to get better. But as far as we are concerned at this point in time, so far so good and still in business. The only thing I want is to get some lions or something on the road and I'm sure I can swing one side or the other and Archie will open his small little window and you might see it. But well, we'll keep driving, enjoying the rain, enjoying the darkness and Sydney, I don't know whether he would want to be here or he would want to be where he is. <laughs> I wish that rain was here. It's so very hot here by the Mpumalanga province at the moment. During the night it's so warm. So I think if the rain comes to this side of the world, we are going to enjoy it because it's going to get much cooler. So I'm going back to the a cheetah cut line and see if maybe we cannot be lucky with anything coming out from the church wood as at the moment it looks like uh, there's quite a lot of things happening by the church wood side as it is the same area Tingana was last spotted Kalamba is always there Chandi has been spotted there now Hosanna we saw him yesterday going to the same area so I think it's ideal going to double check the cheetah cut line <laughs> we want all these cats to come back to this side of Juma. So the interesting thing is where we are going to look at now, the fire break is much more clear and the roads are much more open. So it's very easy to pick up their tracks. Lynn, I didn't copy your question very nicely. <laughs> Lynn, the most effective camouflage of uh, these animals, I can say the best one is the dazzle motion, as I indicated, which is the one for the zebras. That one, I think it works more effectively. That's why zebras, they don't really get uh, affected by predation by these lions. They do get caught, but not very often. Despite their heavy kick, as the zebras, they've got a very dangerous kick and turn mechanism. When they're turning to the right, they kick to the left. When they're turning to the left, they kick to the right. <laughs> <laughs> so they can uh, kick very well the zebras and they also got a very uh, a strong bite. So I think it's important that I also uh, check at this side. We have been here before, we drove here, but I just want to check this area for the second time. As now, uh, the sun is about to go down and when the sun is going down is when the predators such as the leopards are starting to become much more active. Maybe it's when they will be coming out from Torchwood towards at the Juma side. So I have seen the fresh droppings of one buffalo uh, in the middle of the Mulawati drainage line. Maybe that is the buffalo which attracted the lion tracks we have seen earlier.
Maybe Osana got something deep in the Torchwood side yesterday. That's why he's not uh, coming out. We are not seeing any of the sign of him in the area. So he was really on a hunting mood yesterday. So I saw him, I have witnessed him trying to catch a stand-back. So now that the Impalas are having quite a lot of lamps. Uh, Paula, I have not yet seen the uh, chameleons yet. But uh, now is when the chameleons are active. I have seen one chameleon on the road outside the reserve on my way back from the leave. But here I have not yet noticed one. Maybe they are just very camouflaged. <laughs> So no luck by the eastern side of the uh, cheetah cut line. So which means now I'm going to have to drive all the way up uh, much more towards Buffalo's Hook again to see if there is no other tracks by the cheetah cut line. So the difference between me and David is that I am driving where it's dry and David is driving in the rain. So let's have experience of both these game drives. How interesting to have two different uh, worlds, one with rain and one very dry where Sydney is. And I'm wondering whether it is uh, Tristan or Manu or Achi, because it's not me who did the rain dance. Eh? And once you do the rain dance, this is exactly what happens. Achi, was it you? I'm not sure he is hearing me or he's just ignoring me, but uh, it's very strange. We get rains here, but not as big. I remember way back uh, in my village, my grandfather would tell me there are times when it was very dry. And if there was big drought, people had plans of trying to bring the rain. And what they did, they would get one particular ship, and that ship had to be only one color. One color, I'm saying, if it was black, it wasn't even one far, not one hair that could be white. It was spotless black. And if it was white, it was spotless white. And not sure the eyes were white, but it was meant to be only one color. And what they would do, your particular trees, they would go and make a ritual near those trees. And those trees are what you call the fig trees. I'm sure all of you know the fig trees. And there were particular elders, there were particular people in the village who could only do that. Not every other, you know, Tom and Dick and Harry would do that. So there were particular elders and the villagers would go to them and beseech them, you know, this drought is so bad, no water, our animals are dying, we are going hundreds of miles to look for, you know, water to fetch, for cooking or laundry. You need to do that ritual. So the moment they would get a couple of those sheep, be it five or ten, I can't remember how many I was told, they would get them together. And these elders would drive this sheep towards those fig trees. And what they would do, they would go under those trees and they would slaughter them. And they did not touch any meat from what they slaughtered and all the stomach contents would be spread around those trees and there were particular prayers, you know, they would make or there were a particular way they would talk either to the traditional god or I can't remember what and that process was taking about, I hear, a day or two and as soon as they finished to do that they would start heading back to the village and what I gathered, or what I remember is, before even they would leave the ritual area where they had the sacrifices done, before even they would start, you know, preparing to go back, people would say thunderstorms would be pop, 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 pop. The next thing you'd hear or see were lightnings. And the truth is, before they would get back to the village, the heavens would have opened and it would rain. I'm sure 
I can't remember who told me. Uh, dog, I mean, no, not dogs and cats. It would be raining buffaloes and elephants. And truly, the dynamics, the ball game would change. Lots of rain and it would turn green in a very short time. And the village has to be like, well done to those elders. Not sure whether that still happens today. I do not know. And the times I've always thought, well, can I go and try it? Paula, I agree with you, and I think dancing the shower could be something very special. So I do not know, I mean, Paula, whether I would be able to do the same today myself, but I would wish to, draw, to try. Not sure I have the right age, but the people, Paula, who do that to a particular, you know, elders who would easily do that. The only other thing, Paula, I remember we would do, instead of going to the river or to the dams to bathe ourselves, would just stay in the rain, you know, without clothes on, excuse my language, and rain would fall on us and using some uh, leaves from the, you know, from the bush, which could easily make some form, and just bathe in the rain. They'd come back home in the village being very clean boys, you know. And our mothers would just look at us like this, shake their heads. And the only one thing I remember my mother used to tell me, she doesn't want to hear anybody cough. If you cough, go back in the rain and spend the night out there and i don't know whether today's children are able to do the same and i'm thinking we were either less than 10 years old it's way back well we're still soldiering on the rains haven't stopped they have not uh, relenting they still keep hammering us and we're gonna keep trying to chance on anything on the road Archie, how are you doing back there? Archie's just going like this. I'm not sure what that means. But so... We're gonna keep trying here in the rain, but I think there's a gentleman who is driving in very dry weather. I am right on the Echita cut line where I am not seeing any of the sign of any of these cats here but I'm gonna just keep going and going until I now check the Buffalo's Hook cut line. Maybe we might be lucky much more towards the Buffalo's Hook cut line. Oh, I'm lucky with the fork tail drongo. So you can see the, the foxtail drongo. Look at that background, how nice it's looking, nice and green. So the foxtail drongo, look at the tail, it's like a fork. And this is one of those birds who does eat quite a lot of insects and even use strategies such as uh, mimicking some of the predators just to get rid of the other birds to avoid competition in the area. So he was uh, too fast to fly away. I've got to carry on now and see if we can find any other interesting animal. Actually, it is so green. Both grasses and trees are so excited at the moment. If you look at these grasses here on my right hand side, you can see how green that is. This grass, when the animals are feeding on it, they don't get pressurized at all at the moment uh, because uh, the animals cannot concentrate on a specific place. But when animals are concentrating by the same block every time, it gives the grass quite a lot of uh, um, pressure. And instead of some of the grasses to grow, uh, instead of the, some of the grasses to grow up, they lie down. So now let's cross over to the Masai Mara where Tristan is uh, ready to come back. Well, unfortunately, we've had a few gremlins of our own and, and that means that we've been kind of following these lines for a little bit and they unfortunately are heading into an area where we're not going to be able to follow them which is a shame I was hoping that they weren't going to go the way they've gone but they these guys are for now sitting back these are the last three 
everybody else has already gone there going straight up the escarpment but up a kind of forested section that cuts into the escarpment and it is impossible to follow through there so it's not even you're not even going to try to even follow them much further than here i'm hoping that these three boys will stand up and start moving i think it's boys difficult to see um well i can't see anything it's obviously just whatever the camera sees itself but these guys are for some reason very intrigued by something they all stopped there and they all kind of rolled around and have had a good time bonding over there now brendan will the all all males for um sub adults form coalitions yes um provided they all survive so provided the kitchen boys don't get overthrown and new males come in within the next two years or year and a half and then they should form a coalition um how many in each coalition would be interesting um it it i I mean, if if seven of them, which is what I counted this morning, apparently there is nine, but um, I, I've counted seven only. Um, if there's seven of them, then that is a, a big coalition, and and whether they stick together, I'm not sure. If they do, they will rule this entire triangle, <laughs> really, because they won't have much competition. But what often happens when you get big coalitions like that, particularly at the times of the year where there's the migration is not here, food for that many big males is really tricky to find. Um, as well as the distribution of the females makes it you know almost impossible for the seven of them to stay together all all the time and so what you'll get is a probably splitting off of maybe two or three um going in their own directions um and and forming some, like, two or three coalitions and then every now and then kind of coming together and separating out um the only ones that really have kind of been big 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 coalitions like that um in the mara has been the musketeers notch and sons um was a big coalition as well um, but i don't think there's been a coalition of seven has there maybe i'm wrong i mean i, I could be wrong you know there's a rich history in the mara that's long before my time so there might have been a coalition of seven or more but I certainly haven't heard about them um so you know it's going to be tough for seven males to survive together and like i say that just the amount of females will and the smallness of a lot of the prides um within the triangle will mean that you'll probably find that they'll split apart quite a bit um spend lots of time as twos or threes or on their own and then come together much like the musketeers do if you see the musketeers it's very seldom that they spend huge amounts of time as all four hmm francis that's a good question actually i'm not sure to be honest with you i would imagine lions i'm gonna go with lions um have better eyesight in the dark than hyenas but i might be wrong do they have a tortoise or something that they're eating hold on let's get a little bit closer manu i think they might be eating a tortoise imagine it's a pangolin manu that would be cool that would be very epic but i don't think so there's definitely something that they're chomping on here so i'm just using my lights so i can actually see where i'm going Yes, me and my rainbow luck. What are you two boys chomping on? It's something that is round and big. What is it? It is. Is it a pangolin? It looks like a pangolin. It is a pangolin. It's a pangolin. Look at that, guys. That's ridiculous. So the lions are busy playing with a pangolin. No, man. <laughs> what are the chances? That's crazy. Now this is a super, super rare animal. And what are the chances of them playing with a pangolin? No, I don't believe it. That is ridiculous. Now, Emma, if we can, I think we should take this to a lot more people because one is it is an incredibly special animal. Two, to see lions playing with it is even more rare. So this is something that we are not going to get very often at all and i hope that they're not going to leave it alone now because it's rolled into a tight ball to defend itself this is insane look at that can you hear the claws on its scales no i can't believe our luck this is amazing wow now, pangolin has got to be, besides a leopard, got to be one of my favorite animals and not something that we get to see often at all. In fact, we very, 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 very seldom see one. No, don't leave it now, lion, because I want to show people. Oh, no, the lions have left it. Mrs. Lapwing, he has been playing soccer now. Let's see if the pangolin's okay. Should be okay when they roll up like that. 
they're going to be kind of together now it's actually my fault because I was so far away that I didn't notice that that's what they had found oh that is ridiculous now come on little one you're gonna have to unroll at some point so that we can see you this is insane guys this is a pangolin that is only the second one we've ever 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 gotten live on camera their last one was with Brenty and he had it and it was actually inside the Kruger National Park so this is very special right now I think we can go live anyway Emma even though it's not moving let's try and see it will come out unfolded eventually it's not going to stay like that forever it just probably thinks the lions are still around so we can still go live and we'll discuss the whole thing while the lions are still close by Good evening everybody and welcome to the Masai Mara and with a very 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 special animal we've just managed to find a pangolin which is curled up in a very tight ball at the moment and the reason why is because lions were actually playing with it we didn't realize what the lions had and we drove up and they had found this pangolin and they were trying to chew into the pangolin but it was too kind of curled up and its armor plating was too tough for it and so the lions have moved off and we've sat with the pangolin now in the hope that it's going to start unraveling and we'll start to get it to move now pangolins are an incredible animal they're not something that we get to see very often at all in fact they're an animal that is incredibly rare and is the most trafficked animal in the world these days and so they are vitally important that we actually when we get to see one which is like I say extremely rare this is only the second time that we've managed to get a pangolin on this particular um, product that we produce in almost 10 years so that gives you an idea of how rare these guys are they are not common at all and so the thing is is that they are used for their scales now is this let's see if it's going to move I thought I saw it just twitch slightly what you'll find with these guys is they roll up into this defensive ball and they've got this long tail so the tail is what's closest to us at the moment it's very difficult to make out um, what's actually going on but the tail is closest to us and it rolls round and protects their head and their head tucks in and those hard scales um, will protect the soft underbelly where the legs and the face is so that they don't get hurt when things like lions come across them because they're not fast animals and this does happen. Laurie, can it breathe like that? Yes. So if you have a look, it's it's a bit tricky to see, but in the middle of that, there you'll see that there's a, a sort of contour, which is the, the tail coming round, and then it, there's almost like a little gap that goes down. Now that is where the actual kind of face will be, and so there's air getting in there and they can breathe. I've luckily seen quite a few pangolins in my time, and every time they roll up like this they can stay like this for quite a long time particularly if lions have been around and they will just curl up and they wait and they wait and they wait and only when they're really sure that the lions are gone they might even be curled up because I'm talking at the moment and only when they're really sure that the lions have disappeared will they then unravel themselves and they'll start to move and it is an amazing thing that we are, I can't actually believe that we've managed to find a pangolin when we saw the lions kind of messing around I thought maybe they'd gotten a tortoise but tortoises aren't at, out at night and so I thought maybe just maybe there's a pangolin and we have got one which is insane so very very cool now I forgot to introduce myself as well my name is Tristan and on camera I've got Manu this evening and we are coming to you live which means we want to hear from all of you so remember to be able to send through your questions and comments um, to well, in the comment section below and we'll basically answer as many as we can giraffe girl what is the main diet of a pangolin well pangolins will spend their time feeding mostly of things like uh, termites um, ants where they ha will basically go along they've got these four limbs that almost look a little bit like t-rex when they walk so they're on their back legs two front legs and they have long claws and the claws they'll then scrape at the mount and they open it up and then they have this tongue that is pretty much the length of their body so it almost attaches close to their back legs their hips and it kind of comes out and it will go down and it's very sticky and it will pull out those little insects and bring them back into the mouth and they'll then feed off that and so that's probably why this one is out today after the bit of rain that we've had that's going to mean that it's going to um, going to show the, well, the soil is going to be softer much easier to dig I just want to move slightly so you can see if maybe we can just get a view of any lions that might be around the lions look like they kind of moved off unfortunately into the distance they got fed up of trying to kind of go towards this pangolin and try to sort of eat it now they went off in that di distance there you can see there's a bit of rain that's falling I'm going to use my spotlight just to give Manu a bit of help but unfortunately the lions have really disappeared 
Um, the last one I saw was walking there just before we went to all of you. We just saw it disappearing over this ridge. So Graham, you're asking where in the Mara am I? Well, I'm in the Mara Triangle, basically straight below Angama Mara. So on the northern point of the Mara Triangle. So there is our pangolin. I'm going to just move slightly so that Manu can actually get a better view. So we can show you a bit more of the details because at the moment we're in a bit of a tricky spot with the grass. So we're just going to get... Manu, I'm going to go round a little bit so that we can see a bit better. So we're a little bit higher than what the grass is and then we should be able to see a little bit better so yeah Graham we're right up in the north there we go now crystal are pangolins nocturnal not strictly they are active more at night so they do like to move around a lot in the evenings um, because it's a lot easier for them to go and they don't get harassed and spotted as easily but they are not strictly nocturnal they can be seen during the day um, I have seen of the this is now my eighth or ninth pangolin that I've seen um, two of them were during the day the rest have all been at night so um, funny enough out of the pangolins that I've seen two have been accosted by leopards and this one now by lions and you can see that armor plating it almost looks like a pine cone um, that you can see here and basically that armor plating is like your fingernail but in incredibly thick um, so if you had to go and kind of touch that it almost feels like armor and you can knock on it and it would be very very hard and that's why the lions actually leave it alone is because their mouths just can't get a purchase on it it's because of the hardness and especially tonight when it's wet it's gonna be slippery and they, they teeth are just going to slide on that keratin kind of armor plating and that's why eventually they're just going to leave it alone they're going to get frustrated and move on Bill, so pangolins are solitary. Um, you only see them by themselves unless, of course, they have a pup, um, which will mean that they have the little baby. And often the baby rides on their back, which is super cute. A little baby pangolin is the cutest little thing in the world. Um, and they'll ride on the back of, of, of mom. But yes, solitary. Otherwise, you won't see them in pairs unless, of course, you're very fortunate and you find mating pangolins, which is, well, then you must go play the lottery that night because you're going to get very lucky. So Stephanie, it's obviously very dif difficult for you to be able to get any idea of a sense of scale um, for these guys. And so basically in terms of size, um, if it was to unravel and to, to basically stand and, and it have its tail dead straight and its nose out, it would be probably from the dashboard, so from about there to the end of the dashboard. So they're about, what's that, <sighs> maybe my arm's length? So just over about a meter would be from the tip of the tail. Now I actually do have a photo of one that I can show you when they unraveled. Now this particular species that we're seeing, I'm just trying to see where I can get a photo for you. Um, this particular species is called a Temmings ground pangolin. Um, which is the species that you get here in East Africa down towards South Africa you get them then in the Congo and and forest areas of South Africa I mean of Africa sorry you will get black belly pangolins um, tree pangolins and so a few other different species as well Kathy they are ferocious you have to be very careful they'll attack you at the moment no I'm joking they, they will not attack a person um, they are are completely harmless to people um, so basically and that's what makes them a bit of a, a th w w why they're so threatened is because they don't really have any defense people come across this animal it's got nothing that it can do other than roll into a ball like this um, which works really well for predators that are natural to them but as people obviously you know we can we can get through that and so no they don't s release any sort of gas they don't release any sort of substance that can burn your skin or anything like that the only thing they can do is roll in this ball but I will tell you something is if you pick them up and they're agitated what they do is they almost vibrate their body and those scales move and they actually can lacerate your hands quite quickly you can see how chipped and broken those scales are and that's all kind of going to cut you up if you try and pick them up so normally what happens is people grab them with bags into bags and then they they take them out of the reserves illegally and then from there normally is they are boiled um, hole like this and then the scales are pulled off and used so it's a bit of a, a bit of a problem um, and like I said they are the most trafficked animal in the world currently which is pretty scary so it's a it's a horrible thing to think that we've got animals out here that are being poached at the rate that they are and tons and tons and tons of pangolin scales are leaving Indonesia and Africa every every year 
Xavier, you're asking if they're related to armadillos. Well, no, not really. They're not the same species. Um, armadillo has a kind of softish body in comparison to these guys. Um, so they're in their own little grouping all together. Now I'm trying to find... Okay, there we go. So I found a photo of it that I can show you guys. I just want to quickly adjust the brightness so that we can actually see. Because my phone has decided, because it's dark, that it must have a very low brightness. So we'll just try to get that up. There we go. Okay. So basically this is what these guys look like when they are unraveled. So they're very, very scaly. Um, you can see a long, long, long tail. Now that tail needs to be long. One, to balance them because they walk on their back legs only. You see their front legs are carried forward, almost like a T-Rex. And then this back tail will actually wrap around like we're seeing now to protect this animal. Then if you have a look, I'll try to zoom in onto this one. Sorry, this is not a high-res picture, but we can zoom in a little bit. You can see there on its front feet, very, very big, long claws, tiny little ear, smallish kind of eye and then a long snout and that tongue will come out of that snout there and they'll then pick it up and go back in which is absolutely amazing to see one of these is the most special thing in the whole world and so we are being so so spoiled i know it doesn't look like much and i know it's just a ball in the grass to some people but the thing is is as a guide now spending 10 years out in the wildernesses of various parts of Africa to only have seen eight or nine of them in that time gives you an idea of how rare they are and I spend pretty much all day every day out in the bush even when I'm on leave and not working I'm in some sort of game reserve somewhere so it gives you an idea how rare they are there are certain places where you can go and you'll find them and you'll have a bit more of a success rate but they are an incredibly special animal and very few people get the opportunity to see one of these things it is it's one of those animals that you kind of wish that you could see and, and that you get lucky enough to see now there's Apparently, uh, we're in a reserve that I've worked before. They reckon that with pangolins, that this is how they do. They'll curl up like this if they've been attacked by a predator, and they sit like this. Um, and if you're talking and those kind of things, they stay like that. As soon as you, if you want them to move, they always say that you start your car. Now, I'm not sure that that's true because we started our car just now and it didn't move. It just decided to stay curled up. I think it's got the fright of its life and I would too if I'd had 13 lions on top of me as well at one point. So there was, I think at one point there was six of them. But like I say, we had no idea what they were doing. They just looked like they were grooming each other and it did, couldn't really see what was actually going on. And so I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, they're grooming quite a lot. And then I, some of them started to leave and others stayed behind. And I thought, no, there's something wrong here because lions typically if one goes then they all start to get up and start to move around um, but yet this one um, kind of well a lot of them stayed behind um, and so I thought to myself well maybe it's something else that they've managed to find and, and so um, we we kind of came a little bit closer and it was a penguin which is crazy now Carla the lifespan for these guys um, tricky it's, they're so understudied but reckon to be about 20 years some anywhere between sort of 18 and 20 years um, would be about the right lifespan for these guys um, but like I say because they're so shy and so um, reclusive there's so little that's really known about pangolins and there's only a handful of people that have actually studied this particular species of pangolin with any sort of success um, and and because it's around at night it makes it even more tricky to find um, the one guy that did study them was a guy that worked in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve in South Africa and um, where our Juma base is and he used to have to go out at night on foot now this guy was crazy his name is Jonathan Swart and he's written them some really interesting stuff about pangolins but he used to go out on foot and he used to track pangolins that he had tagged and he would walk around at night with a spotlight by himself now you walk around in the bush here it is not a very pleasant experience and you got to walk through elephant leopard lion hyenas just to follow these guys around and so it makes it incredibly tough and the problem with them is that they spend a vast majority of their time um, hanging around and so Manu's just having a little scan trying to see if the lions are anywhere near um, the vast majority of their time moving under darker conditions and so they also move in places where vehicles are going to really struggle to go and so unfortunately you know they they're one of those species that it's very tricky to actually be able to study and so that's why there's very little on it but I actually can't believe that we have seen a pangolin tonight like I like I say it's not the most riveting in terms of its movements but um, to be able to see this is so special. Now, Connor, what is the rarest species of pangolin? Probably, ooh, 
I mean, I, I read an article about this the other day, and because they're so sort of understudied, apparently it's, I think it's the black-bellied, I might be wrong, it's either black-bellied or white-bellied pangolin, one of the two of them, um, that is the rarest, um, if I'm correct. I, I must go and double-check that, though. But this particular one here is, is not as sort of high up on the list of rarities. Um, they are quite widespread, and there's probably a lot more of these than we even know. Um, it's just when you drive along, not many people are going to spot that in grass like this. We just are fortunate that lions played with it. Otherwise, the chances of us seeing this thing would have been almost zero. In the grass, when it's curled up like that, it looks just like a rock. And during the day, you would have zero idea that that is a pangolin, unless, of course, you got close enough that you could see the scales. Um, and so they've easily overlooked. And so actual numbers of pangolin are probably not as well known. Now, here in these environments, we've got grasslands where we can probably spot them a bit easier. But you must remember also in the jungle areas, pangolins can be very tricky to find so you know it's it's an interesting animal um in that regard and i don't think numbers are really as well known as what people say they are there's certainly a lot that are missing right unfortunately it's still curled up it's probably still absolutely petrified by the lions and so we waited and we tried and hoped that it would get up and start moving if it does start to move we'll go live again but from Manu and myself and a very very special sighting of a pangolin it's been an absolute pleasure hopefully you enjoyed it and we'll see you guys again sometime soon Well, absolutely ridiculous. Now, I know that you, a lot of people might think that I'm absolutely mad that I've gotten so excited about a big ball of scales in a bush that doesn't look like very much. But I can tell you that they are really, really, really quite special. Um, and hopefully, I mean, I know a lot of you will, without doubt, be completely... Um, completely blown away that we've gotten one i know a lot of you have really asked to see pangolins over and over again and i know we often laugh about it and we say there's no chance um but there we go and i i hope lots of screenshots were taken when the lions were playing with it because it's a very special thing to see that and and we've been utterly spoiled now this pangolin has a friend there's a moth that is about the only action that we've seen from this pangolin that keeps bounding around on it and i'm hoping it is going to unravel i don't think it's hurt by the lions before anybody thinks that it's dead um i don't think that's the case um i just think that what's happened is it's 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 so kind of been played with so much that it, it just feels very nervous and it can probably still hear me talking and that's why it's like this and it's just sitting and it's really kind of feeling as though it's being a bit kind of surrounded by something and so maybe if we just you know stop talking for a little bit and sit quietly you never know maybe just maybe this little creature will actually come out right now sorry emma you broke up badly i lost you a little bit there so if you can just repeat what you said Right, good. So we're going to send you across to David. We're going to sit quietly in the hope that it starts to move. And if it does move, then we'll come right back. But how special was that? Well, just like Sydney, I think that was a super special sighting. And I'm very jealous of uh, Tristan, you know. Uh, Tristan might be leaving the next few days down to South Africa and he's been here for about three weeks and he found me here looking for pangolins and pangolins and he has seen one before me. I am a little bit jealous but uh, sometimes it's the lack of the draw and being at the right place at the right time and to see one, you know, the lions playing with one, I think that was super special. Anyhow, pangolins, as he might have said, tend to move more at night. And where I come from, if you see a pangolin, we have always said you've got a 90% chances of winning a lottery. That is, if you see a pangolin at night, but if you see a pangolin during the day, you have the chances of 101% of winning a lottery. So, 
Not sure how many other people believe that, but from the village I come from, that is the belief. During the night, 90% of what you'd want to do, chances are it will happen and it will go well. If you then Tristan, you need to come close to me and we make a plan. And uh, the only one condition Tristan will give you, the lottery you win, you know how to give me 20% of that and maybe give Archie 10%. So if that's the deal, Tristan, come talk to me tonight and I'll show you how to go about it. All righty. Keep hunting and we need to see who could be on the road. Sorry, come back again, Ayman. See how lucky you might be. I'd be very happy to see a pangolin. Not sure the pangolin was brought out of the barrel because of the rain. Ah. Yes, that sounds a great deal. I don't know whether Sydney want to join in my deal with Tristan of getting 20% of the literary. Uh, Sydney, what do you think of that? I am still looking for one of these cats here in the area and at the same time I'm very jealous about uh, Tristan with a beautiful uh, pangolin, something I haven't seen here in Juma. Yes, I have seen a pangolin before and a story about the pangolin I want to share with you is that when a pangolin is uh, killed by an animal or by anything, if the blood of the pangolin touches the ground in Venda, traditionally, we believe that the rain is not going to come. It is going to be a drought year. A pangolin, uh, we believe that when it's on the ground, when it's dead, blood touching the ground is going to bring the drought. So it's one of those animals you are not allowed at all to kill in Venda. <laughs> so if you kill a pangolin there, you are going to face a lot of problems. But if the pangolin is dead naturally, and this is what happens, normally the scale of the pangolin is taken and you can put it in the glass with water to give the infant and other people to drink before the winter season in order to chase away the cold and to protect them against the flu. <laughs> So now uh, let's uh, quickly go back to uh, the pangolin in the Masai Mara with Tristan. Well, yes, we're still sitting with our pangolin and our riveting moth that is bouncing around, but pangolin still hasn't moved at all. We've been sitting quietly in the hope that it would decide to unravel itself and start moving, but it's locked in tight. I think that thing is going to stay as tightly bound as it can for quite some time. And um, like I say, if I was, imagine if you had 13 lions trying to bite you, you would also probably be in a similar situation. Now, adding to what Sydney was saying is, is about pangolins. Um, I once spent some time, we had a, a funeral at one of the camps that I worked at because one of the owners unfortunately passed away. And on the day of the funeral, we were talking and chatting about things and we went out in the afternoon drive and we saw a pangolin. In fact, that photograph I showed during that broadcast just now with the, the kind of pangolin unraveled that night actually is that same shot. And the guys were telling me, a lot of the local guys, and I don't know, Sydney might be able to confirm this, but that they were saying often when somebody passes away, the, a pangolin gets seen and that it is a sign of that person is still there and it's almost like a message from them, um, which is very, very interesting because today, funny enough, a, somebody that I know and a friend of actually Sebastian that is a guide was, was unfortunately killed by an elephant yesterday. And so it makes you wonder, this is the fourth pangolin that I've seen the day after somebody or day of or after that somebody has passed away, which is a very kind of weird, weird thing in many respects. And I don't really know, uh, it could just be coincidence completely, but this is what the guys tell me and what they believe. Um, and it's... I suppose one of those things so you know it's a it's a 
an interesting kind of take on things. Now, I, I'm really hoping that this pangolin decides that it's going to unravel for you guys um, and and kind of show itself off and that you can actually see it. And, and the main reason why I want it to actually move is that you can then listen to it. Um, and listening to a pangolin sounds really odd. It's not that they call or make a noise, but when these guys walk, um, they have the scraping sound as these kind of plates shift and move you can hear the scraping of them together and it's a really cool sound it's a, obviously very unique to them and it's not something that a lot of people hear so I, I'm hoping that they will do that now ladybird you say well you were being very kind and saying that that's quite a kind of special thing and it is it's a it's a interesting kind of whole story and and like I say it's obviously always sad when one of the guiding fraternity unfortunately has an incident with a wild animal um, and and you know bad things happen but it's a weird thing that pangolins come out and and like I said at the time before when it was happened with that kind of funeral and stuff and the guys was just saying it's it's almost a sign of that person coming and saying to everybody you know it's okay we you know we're still out and about so that's what they say um, I don't know if anyone else has had that experience and like I say Sydney might be able to be kind of somebody that can verify if it's in his culture because obviously Sydney's culture is slightly different to where we are in the Sabi Sands. Um, so Laura you say it's giving you chills? Well I know it's a, it's a weird thing like I say it's a, something that you know you, you obviously don't really kind of give it too much um, notice when you kind of hear it but then when they start adding up it starts to become a weird coincidence in many respects or to be something that could be who knows depending on how you kind of see things um, obviously like I say I mean I, I sit on the fence with these things but it's just weird how it's happened like four of the times that I've seen a pangolin somebody has kind of passed away within a few days or day before um, seeing one so very weird um, but unfortunately like I say it's still curled up I was really hoping that it's going to kind of come up out and out, walk around for you and, and we get to see it um, but that initial kind of part where we saw it with the lion is just absolutely ridiculous still to see that lion kind of with its paws on a pangolin is something that is very very rare to see and in fact probably the only place that you see it with any sort of regularity is in the in Swalu in the Kalahari Desert um, so you see lions often playing with pangolins there it's a good place to actually see pangolins a little bit more regularly than what we do now I must apologize earlier I probably was completely out of control when we saw a pangolin and probably spoke at a million miles an hour and was very excited but that's the way it is I'm afraid I actually I shouldn't even apologize about it because because pangolins are that special um, I believe FC was also a flurry and hopefully you guys at home were also kind of in much excitement and lots of kind of um, I don't know nervous energy I suppose not nervous energy I don't know what the word is it's excitement is the word I suppose that's all there is to it but it got to be one of the more special things. No way did I ever think that we would see a pangolin tonight. Manu, you must also be quite lucky with pangolins because Manu actually is the the last Safari Live um, crew member to have seen a pangolin. He's when did you see it? A month month ago, about a month ago. Uh, Manu saw a pangolin far from where we are now, so definitely not the same pangolin. Um, saw it down towards uh, you know where we saw Kenya the other day. Um, towards who saw it? Lucy spotted it. So Lucy, who's our newest crew member, has seen a pangolin before many of the older staff. Um, so, you know, maybe it's Manu that's the luck. But this afternoon has just been one of those kind of very special drives. And it's an interesting thing because when we left for drive and we were coming down the hill, Manu and I actually weren't supposed to be on drive this afternoon. Um, but James has had to to do a lot of work with the trainees during the course of the day and so we said we'll go out and, and we'll handle things so he can you know have a bit of extra time and uh, get some time with the trainees before he goes and leave and um, we were kind of heading out and I was saying to Manu I feel like we're going to get a, you know an epic sighting and let's go back to the Olololos and I'm pretty sure that there might have been a few people that were a bit skeptical of going to Lions in a hot afternoon and, and you know not much happening but from the moment we got there you know the lions woke up we had the storm that came in that epic views of that um, and then to, to you know to get to this point where we're at right now with the pangolin is 
is pretty ridiculous and I'm sitting here talking and I, it's almost one of those moments where you've got to pinch yourself that on the screen is a little scaly ball called a pangolin um, and that it's just sitting there ever so still amazing. Now Emma you are more than welcome to stay with us I'm quite happy to talk for five more minutes if everybody's happy to listen to me talking for five minutes um, hopefully our pangolin will move you know what's going to happen is we're going to finish the show and the pangolin's going to unravel about 30 seconds after the, the kind of credits roll so we'll hope that it doesn't and we hope that this pangolin listens now pangolin we're talking to you you have to unravel so that everybody can see you so that everyone spreads the word about how special you are and that people stop hunting your kind okay Pangolin's not listening at this stage, but maybe just now. Maybe it just takes a while to sink in past all of those ger keratin scales. Now, maybe a lot of you are agreeing with me. Um, look, we'll, I mean, we'll stick around with it for a little bit after the, even the show, and if, if it does decide to wake up, I'm not going to stay forever, but we'll stay for a few minutes after and decide to see if it is going to unravel. And if it does, whether or not we can kind of get a view for you guys so that you can kind of see it. Um, See, Katal, yes, the moths do really like the penguin. They are best friends. Probably because in some way those moths... There we go, there we go, it's moving. Look, 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 guys. Look, it's moving. It's unraveling. Come on. No, back down again. It's getting there. It's slowly starting to wake up. Come on. So if it's moving like that, then everything is okay. Then it's not, like I said, it's not dead. So many of you might have thought it was dead, but let's just give it a chance. It's definitely moved a little bit. That's the first sign of movement we've had since we first spotted it. Now, come on. Maybe it's all the moths. And it's listening to us, hopefully. Now, we will, if we see it starting to kind of move a bit more and a bit more, then eventually we will we'll just extend the show a little bit so don't worry um, if there is a sign of movement we're not going to cut you guys off and leave you there so hopefully it will unravel but definite little sign of movement there slowly but surely it should open up now Brent says don't be shy is that our Brent or is this another Brent it's very confusing there's two Brents so I don't know how Brent is doing actually shame now while we're sitting with this pangolin talking about Brent but I believe it's another Brent but it's a shame poor Brenty I had, I had spoke to Jamie yesterday evening just to see how Brenty was doing because obviously he had an emotional day um, yesterday morning and, and on top of that had that very very bad infection in his tooth and apparently was really not doing very well yesterday evening in terms of his face was very swollen and sore and but he had managed to get some antibiotics and hopefully that will help um, but Jamie said that shame he was he was struggling a little bit and I think he was a bit heart sore too. Um, as much as he probably wouldn't have said so, he, I think, you know, it was a big decision for him to, to have decided to leave Wild Earth and um, not something that he, he took lightly. I, you know, obviously being probably one of, yes, hopefully he can crawl up into a board and recover, but, you know, being one of probably Brent's I would say better friends at Safari Live and in fact the fact that I'm on his um, his groomsman list is you know we, we chatted a lot about his decision before he made it and you know whether or not it was the right call and he was very conflicted about it even until the last day so you know I think he maybe feeling a little sorry for himself yesterday but hopefully a speedy recovery so Brenty if you are watching or if you Jamie or anybody then I hope that you're feeling better today and that your face starts to come right and that you're your tooth is, settles down. The antibiotics he's on will work pretty quickly, so that should be good. Come on, little pangolin. You you gave us all hope. Come on. Oh, it's not opening us. <laughs> Peter? No, we can't tell if it's a Peter or Patricia. Um, unfortunately, yet. If it unravels and it starts to walk, then potentially, and it's very tricky because you've got to see it from the underside, and if it's got little swollen mammaries, um, um, then you might see 
that it's a it's a patricia but it's very tricky to tell the sex of a pangolin um not an easy thing to do particularly if they roll up and curled in a ball like this now we are coming towards the end of the show but we'll let's just give it an extra minute or two um we're supposed to kind of finish i think in the next sort of 40 seconds or so but we'll give it an extra two or three minutes let's just give it a bash you never know maybe it unravels and we get to see something. One of the, the, the probably the nicer pangolin sightings I've had was on a evening very similar to this. A storm had kind of come through and it just passed, and a pangolin kind of emerged and it actually sat and watched us for a while. And it was almost as if it was kind of tasting the air. And it kept sticking its tongue out directly at us, which was absolutely amazing. And you could see this long tongue and it would kind of stick it out and then look at us and stick it out. And it sat there for what must, it felt like a long time, but it must have been only about five minutes. Um, and it um, just kept sticking its tongue in and out. And to see the tongue was actually pretty incredible. So hopefully, I'm really hoping that it's going to do something for us. There was at least movement, which means we know that it's not dead, which is good thing because obviously those are things that we kind of panic about from time to time but at least you know it's okay everybody is relieved I believe that we do not have a dead pangolin on our hands yes I think we all are so Paula you say come on little fella time to wake up and show everybody I agree Paula come on it would be so nice if it did wouldn't it We've been given so much by nature today, I suppose we can't really be upset if it doesn't, but it would just be the cherry on top if it just emerged with its little face and gave us even a 50 second view of the face and looked at us a little bit and then started to move off. I would be more than happy and would be thoroughly thrilled by it. So, come on, be nice to us. Shame. I think it's being a little bit... Peter, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for being along for the ride that you got to see your first pangolin and many, many others, I'm sure, um, that got to see their first one. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys. Like I say, it's when I was talking about it earlier today, when we were talking about viewers and, and you guys participating in this, is what makes this show so special and why it's it's such a delight for us as as guides to work for something like this it's, i mean you must remember that most of us this is completely foreign um talking to a camera and those kind of things we're used to talking to people in real life um, on the back of vehicles and um being able to interact with people and and not just you know the six people eight people that are on the back of your car but the you know hundreds and thousands that are on the drives and, and the fact that that community has such a div diverse background and so many people with so many interesting little bits to add to it just makes it that much more special and, and we're, we're a very small part of this entire kind of community and, and you guys are certainly the, the bulk of it and which like I say it makes it a, an interesting and, and special kind of um, thing to do and, and certainly a very very pleasure to come out here every day and show you guys wildlife through our eyes which you know is also a very special thing for us because we get to see the things we like and hopefully that it rubs off on you guys Chimwana you say you've never heard of a pangolin until now and that's precisely what I was hoping for is why I would hope to get pangolin sightings um, is because there's so little that so many people have no idea what a pangolin is and when they see a pangolin they always lump it with an armadillo and it's not an armadillo it's not in any way the same animal it doesn't occur in the same places and it certainly is in a far worse of state than what armadillos are so when people see it then they start to ask questions about it they start to look into it they start to realize these things and hopefully that can turn the tide and we can start to actually protect these animals far better than what we have already because we are failing this animal rather um rather rather badly and and it's not great the good news no so whoever told you that it was a cross between a penguin and a lion has has got a wicked sense of humor and has sold you down the river I'm afraid so it is not at all and uh, while it may be a mythical creature in many respects because we hardly ever see it, it certainly isn't something that is a cross between anything. Oh, little pangolin. 
All right, so Emma, I think let's we can finish up now, and I'll sit here. For, I promise I'll send, I'll sit with it for another ten minutes or so, and if it does, I'll certainly go back live again. So just pay attention to your notifications, and then we can, you know, because otherwise we might sit here for three, four hours. Um, but I will sit with it myself and see if we can send all the other guys home. But anyway hopefully you've enjoyed it hopefully the penguin does move and we'll see you again just now if it doesn't though what a special 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 evening we've had we've had a bit of everything today from getting stuck marshmallow club to pangolins to lions to storms to all kinds of folklores with sydney so from sydney david myself emma and for final control all the cam ops it's been an absolute pleasure and we'll see you all tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari